This novel is possible because of a Patreon member request. You can become a Patreon member if you want to request. The link to my Patreon account is given at video discretion. It helps a lot thanks for watching this video. Also if you want to support the author of this novel, the link of the author's credit is given below. Chapter 101, Aquatic Trials, Friendships, Rat Quinn looked down into the well-known as Hadal Encumbrance. It was definitely of the most intriguing concepts Quinn had seen, and only by researching the subject he had realized why it was called as such. Hadal, from the Greek god of the underworld, Hades. The underworld, which was the realm of Hades, was under the ground. Similarly, it would be the aquatic world that resided below the ground level. The Hadal encumbrance represented the ocean depths in its deepest regions, where oceanic trenches lay. A place where humans couldn't survive and only those species evolved to withstand the harsh conditions would tread the waters where the warmth and light of the sun didn't reach. It is interesting how the creator was able to emulate the water pressure at ocean depths, noted Quinn as he stared down the well, and he could see the extraordinarily still water, remembering the pressure that would assault as he went down. One of the simplest definitions of pressure stated that pressure was the force exerted on a body. The air around the globe had weight, and it pressed against everything it touched. That pressure was called atmospheric pressure or air pressure, it was the force exerted on a surface by the air above it as gravity pulled it to the earth. The oceans were deep. If one was to shave off all the continents and fill the trenches in the oceans with the ground from the continents, the entire globe would be covered with water about two miles in depth. And within those depths was the world of pressure. When one was in contact with air, a body would feel the pressure from the air, and it was dubbed air pressure. Similarly, when in contact with water, a body would feel the pressure from water and had the name hydrostatic pressure, or water pressure. But the main difference between air and water pressure was that air was 830 times less dense than water, meaning that water pressure was much higher than air pressure. As one went down into a sea or an ocean, more water would get piled up on top and thus increase the weight of water above and thus increase the pressure on the body. Here, the water pressure increases much quicker than natural aquatic depth, said Quinn as he sat by the ledge with his chin resting on the palm. I guess this would be difficult for some people. Quinn had gone through two trials, Poseidon's wrath and Tihom's delight. And in those trials, Quinn had struggled a lot. Poseidon's wrath required fine control over magic to get to the center. Without fine control, I would have stuck there without any progress. Tihum's delight required ingenuity or maybe luck. Without the ripple sonar, I probably would have found the entrance, but it would have been completely up to luck. He continued to stare down the well and recited his thoughts about what was required by this trial. Hadal encumbrance simply requires power. Pure magical force to overcome, oppose, and repel the emulated oceanic pressure. I guess this trial is compatible with me. Quinn had magical power in abundance. He had deep magic reserves that had been built through the daily exhaustion of his magic. Ever since Quinn was five, Quinn had used all of his magic every day. The only exception to that rule was the time he didn't have any control over his magic. That had given Quinn deep reserves of magic that were perfect for Hadal encumbrance. He just needed to optimize his magic usage against the pressure and pour his vast reserves into the magic till he reached the bottom. So unlike the first two trials, Quinn was having a breezy time in going through Hadal encumbrance. All right, let's see if I can break my high score, said Quinn and dove into the well of water with accelerated water pressure increase. With his body facing downward and aligning his entire body horizontally with the surface of the water slash floor of the well, he sank down. The purpose of this posture was to decrease his surface area vertically. The pressure in the vertical water column changed very quickly, meaning that the pressure at his head would be significantly less than that at his feet. So to get a uniform pressure all over his body, he distributed his body surface area horizontally. That way, his body mostly would have a uniform pressure. As Quinn sank down, a cylindrical area constructed with water magic manifested around Quinn. The pressure inside the cylinder was normalized to the level of surface level pressure. In no time, Quinn reached 50% of the total depth without feeling any difficulty at all. The difficulty to keep the pressure normalized came when he hit 60% depth. I wonder if the pressure here is because of gravity manipulation or it is simply water magic that is pulling down the water. Quinn realized that the entire aquatic vault was based around water concepts. The instructions in the stone cave explicitly talked about laws, but that didn't mean that the trials were created via water magic. In Poseidon's wrath, the vortex had been definitely created through water magic. But the vast array of conjuration and charm disablers weren't part of water magic. The sheer calmness of the water that even weakened Quinn's ripple sonar was definitely achieved by water magic in Tihom's delight. But Quinn realized that the extensive sensory deprivation didn't have anything to do with water magic. The zero ambient noise could have been achieved through a sound dampening magic application. That state where the light was getting blocked could have been light magic weaved into the water and not an application of water magic. And just like that, the accelerated gradient pressure increase might have been accomplished by other magic and not water magic. But one thing Quinn was sure of was that if he was to complete the vault, he would need to use water magic to get past every trial. Not because the trials were closely related to water, sure, that was a part of it, but the real reason was that Quinn constantly used water magic as he thought using water magic made his job easier. It was clear that everything was related to water. From that, it could be inferred that the vault wanted Quinn to use water magic. And if he was to use water magic, then his journey would be a whole lot easier. Sure, inside Poseidon's wrath, 
Quinn could have extensively studied conjuration magic and tried different spell designs till he got a hit that wasn't covered by the wards. Or he could design a new type of broom that didn't use the traditional broom charms and reinvent the wheel. But all of those required much more thinking and effort on Quinn's part just to make the end result easier. If he had something that would allow him to fly over the vortex into the center, he wouldn't have to struggle against the raging water, but at what cost? How much time and research would it take him to accomplish that? And when Quinn did create something like that, would he start the next trial? Would the broom that worked in Poseidon's trial be helpful in Tihum's delight? No, it wouldn't be helpful. What would be effective was the knowledge and experience of water magic that he practiced and researched to get past one trial. That is why Quinn didn't try to find unique methods outside of water magic to solve the trials. Because Quinn knew that if he stuck with water magic, then it would make his job much smoother. And the results were showing right now. Quinn had plenty of magic to expend from his reserves. What he needed was simply to change how he was directing his magic. Poseidon's wrath had driven him to gain fine control over water magic so that he wouldn't be blasted every time he tried to water magic, and that was working now when extreme pressures were bearing down on him. 90%. The water magic cylinder's surface thrummed with erratic ripples. A humongous pressure was being normalized by using water magic as Quinn applied an equal and opposite force. Just a little more, and I will pass this trial without much problems or injuries. Quinn dipped further down and reached 92% but stopped because the pressure inside his normalized cylinder suddenly increased, and Quinn could feel the pressure against his bones. Some pressure is leaking through. This is the limit for now. Quinn retreated by a percent and stayed at 91%, and carefully tried to figure out how to normalize the pressure back to the surface level. He was extremely careful because one mistake and the pressure would bear down on him, and his muscles wouldn't contract, which would seal away his movement capabilities while the water inside his lung cavity with lower internal pressure would be pushed out, and he wouldn't be able to breathe. In the water column, Quinn swam alone inside the dangerous waters while trying to figure out how powerful the deep oceanic waters were. Scenes break. It doesn't work that way, sighed Marcus as he sat in the Ravenclaw common room in front of a chessboard. The knight only moves two squares vertically and one square horizontally, or two squares horizontally and one square vertically. But why? The horsey should be able to charge straight ahead, spoke Luna as she stared at the knight chess piece on the wizarding chessboard. I have seen them. They are fast, you know. Wizard's Chess was the magical variant of the classic board game chess, in which the pieces were enchanted to move of their own accord when commanded by the player. The moving chess pieces were reasonably sentient and could offer advice to the players who weren't good or experienced at the game. The white knight piece on the board turned its head towards and looked towards its commander. The animated knight chess piece wasn't sure how to proceed. The chess piece wasn't sure how to react to this situation. The magic that made it animated didn't cover what to do when the commander wanted the horsey to charge forward. It looked at his white companions as if to ask what to do, but they looked as confused as it was and shrugged towards the white knight. The black chess pieces, on the other hand, were laughing hysterically. And that made the white pieces feel embarrassed. Marcus turned his face towards Quinn, who was on the floor and sitting in the lotus position. He had his eyes closed, with his hand resting on his lap. Quinn, explained to her that the knight piece can't move straight ahead. Luna also turned towards Quinn. Quinn, why didn't you make the horsey move forward? Why can it only move one way? Quinn, who was in his mindscape sorting and strengthening his memories using a clemency, opened his eyes and looked at his two friends. Marcus was trying to teach Luna how to play chess on the wizarding chessboard that Quinn had made for Marcus as a birthday present. The board and pieces could change colors and shapes. The chessboard was a box with a grid on the top, and within the chessboard were number dials that could be used to alter the animation used by chess pieces to destroy each other when eliminating other chess pieces. He had also crammed a copious amount of chess strategies inside the chess set to advise inexperienced players. Quinn had ordered tons of chess books from both the non-magical and magical worlds because both worlds had different chess strategies and philosophies. Using that data, Quinn had given his chess set a more diverse recommendation slash advice system than any other chess set on the market. It was an elaborate set with extensive charm work that Quinn had devoted time to create for his friend's birthday. But it seemed that even he had failed to take Luna Lovegood into consideration. Quinn turned to look at the white chess pieces, who were holding his head while trying to think what it should do. Then he looked at Luna and gave an explanation. Luna, you see, the horse can charge straight ahead. But the knight on the horse doesn't want to move straight ahead, it only wants the horse to move a certain way. The horse belongs to the knight, so the horse will only listen to the knight. There is nothing we can do. Luna furrowed her brows and turned to stare at four knights on the chessboard, who stared back while stroking the back of their horses, making them neigh and nicer. I see. If that is the case, then that's fine, shrugged Luna, as she accepted Quinn's reason quite easily. She stood up and spoke to Marcus. I'm parched. I'm going for water, do you two want anything? Marcus politely refused while Quinn, who had once again closed his eyes, silently shook his head. When Luna went away, Marcus turned to Quinn and asked. What are you going to do when she finds a chess set with only a horse as a knight piece? Let's worry about that when the time comes, replied Quinn without opening his eyes. Marcus sighed before flipping a switch on the side of the chessboard that made the chess pieces stick to the grid so that when the box opened, they wouldn't fall off. He looked at the array of dials and switches that customized the playing experience and turned off the destruction feature when attacked. 
He didn't want to answer Luna's questions which were full of curiosity on why the chess pieces were acting mean to each other. Quinn, who had his eyes closed, smiled very softly at the sight of his friends getting along. Marcus was the one to invite Luna to play chess when he saw her sitting by Quinn's side, drawing random scribbles. And Luna had accepted the offer with enthusiasm and without doubt or skepticism. It had taken a lot of time for Marcus and Eddie to warm up to Luna because of her eccentric personality, and even though Quinn was still the connection between the two parties, the two boys and one girl had become friends. And Quinn felt happy because of that. Scene break. After learning the whereabouts of the Potter family from Pettigrew, Voldemort traveled to Godric's Hollow on the fateful night of October 31, 1981. After breaking the protections on the house, Voldemort was able to enter the residence and blasted the front door open, catching its inhabitants off guard. Fleamont Potter, who had left his wand on the sofa, was murdered quickly trying to defend his wife and grandchildren. After Voldemort killed Fleamont Potter, he proceeded to go upstairs to Harry's and Ivy's nursery, where the grandmother and the twins were trapped inside. Cornered in the nursery, Euphemia Potter was murdered after trying to oppose Voldemort and defend her grandchildren, the green light from this act actually lighting up the entire upper floor. When the Dark Lord then attempted to murder the one prophesied to defeat him, the protection laid down by his grandmother's loving sacrifice caused the killing curse to rebound. It destroyed Voldemort's corporeal body but unfortunately also took out a significant chunk of the cottage's upper floor. Harry was left with nothing but a lightning bolt scar on his forehead, and Ivy miraculously came out unscathed from the incident while Dark Lord Voldemort's powers were temporarily destroyed. Henceforth Harry was known as the boy who lived and was marked as Lord Voldemort's equal, thus sealing his fate. But there was someone else there, who waited outside, and saw the entire upper floor roof blew up. Peter Pettigrew, who nervously stood outside, was feeling ecstatic on the inside. He was the one who led the Dark Lord to the Potter Cottage, and for that, he was going to be rewarded. But then he saw the roof blew up, and immediately Pettigrew knew something was wrong. The rat Animagus cautiously entered the cottage, and on the ground floor, he saw Fleamont Potter on the ground. But after a short glance, Pettigrew ran up the stairs, and there he saw the dead body of Euphemia Potter and two crying infants. Pettigrew was stunned out of his mind. He couldn't believe the sight in front of him. He looked at the floor of the bust-up room and saw the unique wand of Dark Lord Voldemort lying down in front of him. The Dark Lord is dead. And Lily and James aren't here. Those thoughts scared the life out of Peter. He had betrayed the Order of Phoenix and corrupted to the evil side. That decision was made because Peter thought that he was choosing the winning side. He had stacked a stable life where he lived comfortably to risk it for a life of luxury and superiority. And the scene he was seeing screamed at him that the dream was over and he had destroyed his life. As Peter panicked from his innermost being, he heard the sound of Sirius's motorcycle from outside the house, with several pops of apparition following. They are here. In that moment of trepidation and fright, Peter picked up the wand from the floor, and because of the broken wards, he operated out from the room itself and faded away from the scene. From there on he started following the events that led him to be captured and imprisoned in Azkaban. And now, twelve years later, Peter was inside his old house, sold to some old couple, who were dead from killing curse cast from a wand that he had stolen from a chump who had left it on a table of a pub while refilling his drink. Peter, still as sickly and gaunt as he was when he got out of Azkaban, looked down on the bathroom floor and waved the wand to perform magic, violently, every single tile was pulled out from the floor. The foundation then was butchered by blasting curses until three feet in depth and a wooden chest surface out on the top. The large chest levitated out of the dirt onto the floor. Two snaps of unlocking, and Peter used his skeleton hands to open the lid to reveal the sole object inside the wooden chest. Here you are, said Peter, his voice wispy and coarse, but his eyes shined with vigor and tinge of mania. Peter picked up the object and stared at it with fascination. The Lord's Wand. The symbol of his power. In his hand was a thirteen one half inches long, crafted from you, and affixed with a phoenix feather core. The phoenix feather wand showed its pickiness and didn't react to Peter's touch and magic. In the hand of Wormtail, the U wand would be the same as a stick. From his pocket, Peter took out a rat and watched the familiar creature stunned and unconscious. It is time to bring him back, declared Peter as he clutched the wand in his hand, closed his eyes, and imagined the day he would of his revenge. After covering up the mess in the bathroom, Peter left his old house and silently yet determinately looked into a particular direction as a plan formed in his mind. Dash asterisk asterisk dash asterisk asterisk dash asterisk asterisk. Quinn West, MC, the water is always deeper than what it reflects. Marcus Belby, likes to play chess, owner of the only chess set crafted by Q West. Luna Lovegood, learning chess, likes activities that require more people. Chapter 102, Marcus Belby, Deal of Friendship. Marcus Belby was a wizard and a Ravenclaw student at Hogwarts School of Witchcraft and Wizardry and was a year above the famous Harry Potter. He was from the British Isles and of the magical Belby family. The Belby name wasn't famous in political circles or in the world of business. The place one would recognize the Belby name was in the academic circles. Two members of the Belby family had substantial contributions to the study of magic. Flavius Belby had been the first person to come across a lethifold and survive to tell the tale. In addition, he had been a master in charms and well-versed in the art of defense against dark arts. And he was the person who discovered the way to chase away lethifolds, also known as living shrouds, a carnivorous and extremely dangerous magical beast. 
It was also considered a dark creature because of its extremely aggressive and violent nature. In a surprise combat against a lethifold, Flavius had discovered that the lethifold could be driven away with a patroness charm. That day Flavius, while fighting for his life, accomplished a never-before-seen act. Flavius went on to research his discovery and its credibility and finally gave the world a method to drive away a dangerous creature like lethifold, a dangerous dark creature. His accomplishments were celebrated for centuries after his death and he was immortalized on chocolate frog cards and every Magizoology book that mentioned lethifolds, credited for his contributions. The second famous member of the Belby family had an even greater impact than his ancestor. He had won an Order of Merlin, and was a poti winner who single-handedly had changed the lives and fates of people infected by lycanthropy. A person who had helped people's lives all around the globe and arguably became the most famous poti winner of the 20th century. Damocles Belby was a famous poti winner credited for the invention of the Wolfsbane Potion, which was his greatest achievement among his other contributions to the field of potions. Before the Wolfsbane, the unwilling lycanthropes would rather die than suffer the consequences of losing sanity once every month for the rest of their lives. But after Wolfsbane, there was a beacon of hope in the lycanthrope community. Even though the Wolfsbane potion didn't cure lycanthrope, it was the symbol of progress. It represented faith in magic, that with time, maybe, one day a cure would be found that would rid an unwilling person of the curse of lycanthropy. And from that family came Marcus Belby. He was not the brightest tool in the shed but had a passion for learning that landed him in the Ravenclaw house. Whenever people met Marcus, they saw a soft-spoken, shy boy who was polite and curt. To people with whom Marcus was comfortable, he was a trustworthy friend who was a good listener, a keen observer, and a person who appreciated the little things. When you got him out of his shy shell, he happened to be a person with a bright personality, capable of talking at lengths on the topics he was interested in, and a friend who would be there for you no matter what. In Hogwarts, Marcus had two close friends, Eddie Carmichael and Quinn West. Eddie and Quinn had extroverted personalities. They were outgoing and socially confident. And one would think that Marcus would have problems getting along with the two people who had very different personalities than his, but that wasn't the case. He was very comfortable with his roommates. Marcus, who wasn't comfortable taking the lead on things, was grateful that Eddie and Quinn always knew what to do and would pull him along with them. It was easier for Marcus to talk to both Eddie and Quinn because he didn't need to initiate conversation, as the two of them would, for most of the time, would have topics and things to talk about. They would keep the conversation going while Marcus silently listened and sometimes chimed in when he wanted to contribute something. But these days, Marcus found himself alone frequently. Both of his best friends were busy with their own activities. Quinn West, his raven-haired friend, had always been a busy bee. He would start the day early, before him, and finish his day late, after him. Quinn would be busy during the classes doing the homework given to them, after classes, Quinn would disappear, and no one would know where to find him. In the evening, Quinn would spend his time in the A.I.D office that Quinn had built in his second year, and at night, he would regularly break curfew to do his own things. The only reliable way to track down Quinn West was to approach him in the Great Hall, during mealtimes, where you would always, without fail, find him eating his food. For some reason, Quinn ate a lot of food for his size, and if he could help it, he would not miss a meal. Marcus usually hung out with Quinn between classes, mealtimes, and just before sleep time, when Quinn returned after curfew, or if Quinn didn't decide to disappear. Then there was his second roommate, Eddie Carmichael, blonde-haired, talkative, loud, competitive, not afraid to say his opinions out loud, the exact opposite to Marcus. And many times, Marcus envied Eddie's personality. Till last year, Eddie had been free like Marcus and didn't have an extracurricular activity that required time from him. The two would hang around, spend time together playing gobstones, exploding snaps, quidditch catching and any other games they could find to play. But this year, Eddie had decided to train for the quidditch tryouts, and for that, he would wake up early and join Quinn for an early morning workout. And after classes, Eddie would do his own personal flying and quaffle control training. Eddie was way less busy than Quinn and had a lot of free time for playing around. And Marcus still spent much more time with Eddie than he did with Quinn. But things had still changed a lot from the last three years. Scene break. Sitting in a chair inside the Ravenclaw common room, Marcus looked around the room and roamed his eyes over the room. Most of his fellow Ravenclaw students, both younger and older, were studying alone or in groups either completing their homework, studying in advance for the upcoming class or going through extra recommended material from the exclusive Ravenclaw in-house library with the faculty recommendations, among other things. He sighed and looked at the busy people around him, and sighed. At least they know what they are doing. On the other hand, I. Another sigh escaped him, and he sunk further into his chair. A hand suddenly was placed on his shoulder, followed by, now, now, don't sigh. At least not a heavy sigh like that one. Marcus raised his head to see Quinn standing there, smiling. His stone-gray-eyed friend had a barstool in his hand. He then sat in his chair. As he watched Quinn sitting on a barstool, Marcus thought about how in nearly five years he had known his friend, the number of times he had seen Quinn sitting on a chair with a backrest was frighteningly low. Even when the client chairs in the A.I.D office were chairs with backrests, Quinn always sat behind his desk on a barstool. Marcus looked at Quinn, who sat with the best posture he had ever seen from anyone he had met. Proper as always. 
Quinn always sits perfectly well, doesn't he? Thought Marcus and put himself back together from his slumped posture in his chair. You know what they say, right? A sigh is an amplifier for people who suffer in silence, said Quinn. That made Marcus tilt his head and ask. So you don't sigh? At that, Quinn laughed and shook his head. Oh, no, I wish that was true. I sigh a lot, every day. Quinn then sighed, which made point his finger at himself and smile. See, I just did it. Let's not talk about me. Tell me about you, asked Quinn and tapped Marcus's thighs. Tell me why were you slumped in the chair with that introspective expression that you tend to get on your face when you are overthinking stuff. This is it. How does he do it so smoothly, thought Marcus when he heard Quinn. Marcus was used to listening to Quinn. He noticed that whenever Quinn wanted the conversation to go his way, he would very smoothly turn the direction of the conversation to his interest. And right now, he was watching Quinn do it again. But it didn't bring discomfort to his heart to see his friend manipulating the conversation. The reason for that was because Marcus could see the expression on Quinn's face. Usually, whenever Quinn influenced or manipulated the conversation, he would have a situation-appropriate expression on his face. And the times that Quinn smiled, he would have a calm and restrained smile on his lips. That same smile would slightly change according to the need, and those small changes would change the meaning of the smiles, confident, friendly, dominant, polite, embarrassed, and any other smile that Quinn wanted to portray. But right now, Quinn didn't have that restrained smile. The smile on his face was wide and joyous, supportive, comforting, bright and free. This was the real deal and not something that was put on just because the situation demanded it. What? Why are you looking at me like that? Asked Quinn and touched his face with confusion. Is there something on my face? Marcus saw Quinn take out his wand and conjure a mirror to check out his face. Why are you smiling? Tell me, is there something wrong with me? Come on, tell me, stressed Quinn when he looked away from the mirror to Marcus's smiling face. It's nothing. I just remembered something funny. There is nothing on your face, chuckled Marcus. Quinn looked at Marcus with a suspicious face before banishing the mirror. Now, tell me what had turned you into sad sap, asked Quinn, getting the conversation back on track. Marcus stared at Quinn for a while before finally opening his mouth to speak. I was thinking about how both you and Eddie have something you guys do so seriously. It was clear to Marcus that Quinn loved magic. His friend spent time reading books out of the course material. This wasn't uncommon for a Ravenclaw, but to put it clearly, Marcus would rarely see Quinn read the course material. Most of the time, he would see Quinn reading something that wasn't even close to what was being taught in the school. Even recently, Marcus had seen Quinn had been going through numerous books on healing magic and biology. The number of books that changed Quinn's hands had been baffling to Marcus. Then there was Eddie, who had started playing and practicing Quidditch because he wanted to get a girlfriend. Eddie was a person who got dialed in when motivated, he devoted so much time and effort to Quidditch that if one was told the real reason behind his actions, they wouldn't believe it. Of course, Marcus and Quinn knew about Eddie's ultra-competitive nature from their early days of friendship. Eddie liked to win and succeed, and when he didn't win, he would get upset, but instead of throwing a tantrum, Eddie would try again to see if he could win. Quinn and Eddie had been playing the card game concentration for three years, and despite not winning a single time, Eddie would challenge Quinn regularly. Even after losing for three years, Eddie's competitiveness didn't let him back down. Eddie was so competitive that he even challenged Quinn at magic. The two would often play the magical game of tug of oxio. In the game, two to more people would simultaneously cast an oxio spell on an object. The objective of the game was to pull the target object towards them, and the one who was able to get the target object near them would win. Despite knowing that Quinn was better at magic, Eddie would often initiate a game, trying to defeat Quinn at magic, which for obvious reasons never panned out. But that didn't stop Eddie from time and time challenging Quinn. Such was Eddie's personality. You have magic. You love it so much. We all knew that just after a few days of our meeting in the first year. The time you put in just shows how much you love it. Even Eddie is dialed in on Quidditch and won't leave his broom in his free time. That always wants to win idiot won't stop till he makes it to the team, sighed Marcus, looking into his lap and whispering in a downtrodden tone. Only, I have nothing to do. I don't feel passionate about stuff like you guys do. And, well, he paused because it affected him a lot. I feel left out. Like I am wasting my time and that you guys are going to leave me behind. Marcus looked up from his lap and saw Quinn staring at him with wide eyes. Immediately, Marcus thought he had made Quinn would feel uncomfortable and felt embarrassed because of it. He was about to speak up, but Quinn interjected. Marcus, do you remember my sister, Leah? You met her at Hogsmeade, remember? Marcus blinked at the question and silently nodded for the reply. You see, my sister travels a lot, like, a whole lot. She travels almost the entire year and goes to different parts of the world. One week she would be in Europe and the next week in Australia, spoke Quinn, but Marcus wasn't following where Quinn was going with this. But you see, my sister doesn't decide where she goes. My grandfather decides where she is deployed, and he still sends her away. He's been doing that for a couple of years. Can you guess why he does that? Marcus silently shook his head. He barely knew Quinn's sister, he had no idea what Quinn's grandfather was like. My grandfather is trying to make Leah experience new and different things. He keeps sending her to different places to handle business, and while a representative is needed to communicate between countries, there is no need to send Leah as much as he has been sending her. Quinn beamed as he continued. 
My grandfather knows Leah quite well. He knows that if you give Leah new and exciting things, she will try to find more things about them and see what it's all about. So by sending her to different countries that are different from ours, he stimulates Leah's curiosity by introducing her new experiences. Marcus listened as Quinn spoke, and he felt like he understood what Quinn was talking about, though it was out of his reach. Eddie's character will make him pursue things just because he wants to win, but nobody knows how long he will keep doing things that way. He might get bored and drop them to pursue other interests. You say that you don't have anything you are passionate about. And I will tell you this, neither is Eddie. I think the reason Eddie does all these different things and tries to succeed is that he is trying to find something that clicks with him. Marcus saw Quinn raise his hand and bring it near him, Marcus, to repeatedly poke his chest. The only difference between you and Eddie is that he tries all kinds of things and tries to get better at them. Eddie is trying to find something he enjoys, and he has already found one thing. He enjoys playing games, and that might not be something of importance, but it is still something Eddie clearly enjoys. Marcus, if you want to find something that clicks with you have to do new things. Quinn then placed his hand on his own chest and continued. Yes, I love magic, and that is good for me, hooray. But don't you think I spend too much time on it? Look at the three of us. You and Eddie hang out and have fun while I am alone doing who knows what. Pointed out Quinn, and Marcus felt surprised to hear Quinn speak like this. I spend so much time on magic that I have barely any time left for other things. I love to play violin and piano, but because I spend so much time in the library in the A.I.D office, and practicing magic, I haven't played my violin for weeks, closer to a month, and that sucks. Then there is the piano which calms me down. And I haven't touched the keys for so long. I can't spend enough time with you guys. I miss so many things that you two do, many times, I don't understand the inside jokes and then realize that I didn't understand them because I missed things, yet again, and that sucks. I know it sucks, and despite that, I don't try to manage my time better. Marcus felt more and more surprised as Quinn mockingly chuckled at himself. You and I aren't that much different, you know? While you haven't tried to explore new things to see what makes you interested, I have wrapped myself in this thing so tightly that I haven't tried something new in a long while and am losing touch with things that I did earlier. Sure, I learn new magics, and it is so much fun for me. And while that might be seen as doing new things, to me personally, it is the same thing, magic is magic no matter what the branch. And my own view is what matters at the end. Marcus didn't know that Quinn felt like this about himself. The Quinn that Marcus knew was always prepared, confident, a person who commanded any room and company of people he was among. A person who had everything figured out and had his life set. But now, here he was listening to Quinn vent about things that he didn't know existed a few minutes back. And while Marcus knew that he should feel sympathetic for his friend, Marcus felt good. Quinn sharing all this made Marcus feel close to him. It made Quinn someone who wasn't flying miles above him, but someone who was right beside him. So step out of that comfort zone and try to do new things. Out in the wide world, many unique, intriguing, entertaining, mind-opening things exist. It is a complete waste and pity if you don't try them out. You only live once, Marcus, and it isn't too late to try them. Seriously. If you don't have something you aren't passionate about, then find things, try them out. I guarantee that you will find something that suits you, something that will feel like it was made especially for you. Quinn suddenly and abruptly stood up and stared down at the surprised Marcus. Let's make a promise. No, a deal. As long as you try out new things without worry, I will try to get out the bind I have trapped myself in and get myself back to try things, both old and new. Marcus felt his heart beat faster and felt his blood boil with enthusiasm as he stood up. He grabbed and shook Quinn's hand tightly as if the firm grip signified the sincerity of his determination and commitment to this deal with Quinn. Deal, questioned Quinn, staring into Marcus's that now showed seemingly boundless energy. Deal, affirmed Marcus, smiling a curve from the bottom of his heart. Oh make, two weirdos. Eddie Carmichael entered the Ravenclaw common room after performing maneuvers he deemed necessary to be in a chaser's arsenal after an intense session of flying around Hogwitz. Ah, my chest hurts, groaned Eddie as he stepped inside, and the first thing he saw with his tired eyes were his two roommates staring at each other with passionate eyes and ardent smiles on their faces, their hands locked in a handshake as they stood in the smack dab middle of the Ravenclaw room. He stood there for half a minute, staring at his roommates, but they didn't move or break the handshake. What the hell are these two weirdos doing? But looking at them didn't give him answers, and he was exhausted. So Eddie acted like he didn't know them and walked past them to his dorm room. Dash asterisk asterisk dash asterisk asterisk dash asterisk. Quinn West, MC, Marcus. Marcus Belby, a deal of friendship, Quinn. Eddie Carmichael, grinding hard, I am too tired for this shit. Chapter 103, Leviathan's Underpass, and the Raven A very calm Quinn horizontally floated at the near bottom of Hadal Encumbrance and gazed at the triangular entrance in front of him. Leviathan's Underpass. This time it's a monster, noticed Quinn as he stared at the words written above the dark entrance. He had read that after keeping his eyes open at 70% and had, consequently, done some research on the Leviathan. The Leviathan. A mythical creature with the form of a sea serpent. Known originally as a great sea monster in the first chapter of Genesis, the Leviathan has become synonymous with any enormous monster or creature. It was occasionally invoked to accept blame for tsunamis. 
According to legends, the Leviathan was a fire-breathing creature with such immense size that the sea boiled when it swam on the surface. It ruthlessly and fearlessly rules over all the creatures of the sea. The Leviathan's skin is like a double coat of mail with overlapping scales as large as shields on its back and as sharp and tough as broken pottery on its underparts. Swords and harpoons would simply bounce off such protection. It breathed smoke from its nostrils and expelled flames from its mouth, which was rimmed with teeth. Its fins radiated a brilliant light, and its eyes were like the glimmerings of dawn. In the magical world, the Leviathan was a type of dragon that lived in the deep oceans. The non-magical legends had gotten the description right, it was an enormous, long, thick serpent-type dragon and, according to the records, it weighed 5 tons, 5,000 kilograms, clocking at just 1 ton less than the largest dragon species in the world, the Ukrainian Iron Belly. Even though the Leviathan was an aquatic species, they were just like any other dragon species, it was magic-resistant, had resilient scales and had fire breath. On a side note, every part of its body had magical properties. Quinn had thought about the upcoming trial, and one of his worries was to come across an actual Leviathan. If a basilisk could be kept alive for a thousand years through deep hibernation, then there was no reason a leviathan couldn't be kept alive the same way. After thinking it thoroughly, Quinn was 90% sure that a leviathan wouldn't be in there because of the trials he had been through. It didn't make sense to put a leviathan inside because of the prevailing water concept themes. Well, the leviathan is a predator species in the ocean. It might be a guardian-type trial, thought Quinn, followed by another curious line of thought, who would win between a crocken and leviathan, I wonder. Quinn flexed his muscles, and immediately arctic blue magic flashed. The magic originated from his body and went towards the triangular entrance, which created a glowing arctic blue tunnel of water. Let's go in there with the hope that there's no leviathan, wished Quinn, but there was a sharp glint in his eyes. He was prepared to do what must be done, even if it meant killing a dragon. He floated down. His hands touched the edges of the entrance, and though he was at 100% depth, Quinn wasn't feeling an iota of it. The 100% of the pressure intensity was being thwarted by Quinn's magic, where he was applying an equal and opposite force to cancel the weight bearing down on him. Pulling his feet to his front, Quinn went in the entrance to Leviathan's underpass. Scene break. Quinn found himself teleported to the trial, and like in most T-Hum's delight, he was directly transported underwater. However, unlike T-Hum's delight, this room was lit brightly. Quinn looked down and saw that his feet were touching a white marble floor. When he advanced, the white floor extended ahead for around 50 meters. The entire passage was covered with a circular wall of water. It was a tunnel with a white marble straight path as the floor. The space outside the water tunnel was an expanse of blue, and Quinn couldn't see an end to the expanse. Ah, so this is the underpass, huh? A tunnel through the water. Though I am still underwater, noted Quinn as he took in the surrounding scene. He looked straight ahead to the other end of the tunnel and saw another triangular entrance, but this one without a title above it. This entrance was like the one in T. Hum's Delight, although it had another patch of water with a different flow than the surrounding water, there was nothing solid at the end of the tunnel and a wall of water sealed off the end. Noticing that, Quinn looked back and saw the same wall of water. He raised his hand to touch the water wall. He found that the water wall was solid, and his hand didn't cross through the water wall. Now, what is the deal here? I can see that I have to walk to the other end of the tunnel and enter that entrance, observed Quinn and thought about what this trial was composed of, but nothing popped out to him from the get-go. No way, this is a simple path. What is the catch here? Quinn raised his hand, and some of the surrounding water five to form a long ice spear in front of him. Let's see how this does. Saying that Quinn shot the ice lance straight ahead towards the other end. The ice lance raced through the water, and contrary to Quinn's expectation, the ice lance didn't face any obstructions, didn't trigger anything before it entered the triangular entrance, and disappeared. Hmm, unexpected, really unexpected, thought Quinn before turning his eyes to the floor. Another seven ice lances manifested from the water and shot towards seven different parts of the path, but every one of them bounced off without scratching the marble. Nothing at that, too? Ah, uh, I need to go in myself. Don't want to do that, really don't. Quinn sighed and took a step forward on the wider marble, one more, and then another. As he moved forward, a very faint blue line shone on the marble floor. That delicate line on the floor went unnoticed by the boy as he walked ahead. Flip. Ten strides in the walk towards the other end of the white floor, Quinn felt something on his body, the feeling was confusing and sudden, and it was only after two additional steps that he abruptly stopped and looked down on his shoulder. There he saw red coming out of his shoulder. He couldn't see his shoulder because of the red staining the water, but Quinn could feel a deep gash above his collarbone. As the realization hit and the pain set in, Quinn felt two more parts of his body rip, more blood spurted out from his calf and waist as deep gashes marred his body. One of Quinn's transfigured gills also got cut, creating further complications. W what the hell l. Alarms blared inside Quinn's head as his eyes showed panic and alertness muddled with pain and onsetting heaviness because of the continuous blood loss. His mind was slowing down because of his condition, it took Quinn a few moments to focus through the pain and channel his magic into the safety insignia. And as he did that, Quinn's darkening vision saw a swirl of water fissure come into existence 10 meters in front of him, and from the center of that swirl a pressurized jet of water appeared, ripping through the water towards Quinn. 
In defense, Quinn was only able to raise his hand, it didn't help much because the jet of water had cut through the muscles of his arm and pierced his body below his chest, just out of the heart's vicinity. He activated the teleportation, and before disappearing from the Leviathan's underpass, Quinn saw four more swirls forming in the water, ready to shoot lethal, cutting jets of water. Scene break. The water from the triangular entrance set Quinn down on the floor of the stone cave. For a moment, Quinn's eyes remained close as he leaked red blood on the floor. Then his eyes snapped open, and no emotion could be seen in his eyes or on his face. Pain. Pain was something Quinn was familiar with, it was something that he had constantly felt during the time he was trying to get his magic back. Every time he loosened the hold on magic, his magic would rush out, and that would cause pain. With the volume of magic inside Quinn's magical core, the rampant magic had enough juice to cause pain for hours before it drained the core of magic. When Quinn finally decided to confront his magic, that pain followed him for hours every day, and Quinn had to bear with it for a good chunk of the day, every day, till he was able to get his magic back under his control. But in those unpleasant days, the pain was Quinn's primary motivator. It was something that Quinn didn't want to feel, as such, Quinn focused on his emotions to ignore the pain. And now, the pain had returned because of injuries. And with those injuries came back panic, a rush of urgency, and fear among multitudes of emotions. Negative emotions were absent from Quinn's regular, peaceful life, but under the current circumstances, they surfaced and came back to his life. A clumency detached Quinn's emotions to the second level so that they were all but a buzz at the back of his head, but his magic remained firmly connected to his emotions. Five points of injury, shoulder, flank, calf, upper abdomen, and forearm. Quinn's mind sunk into an analytical mode as he analyzed his body. Quinn slightly moved his shoulder and felt the first point of injury. Shoulder, deep cut in the trapezius muscle. Left shoulder disabled. The clavicle bone is safe and unharmed. His attention moved down his body to his waist, and Quinn slightly flexed his abdominal muscles. F-flank muscles, external oblique, internal oblique, transversus abdominis, three-layer of muscle penetration. Quinn groaned in pain because of the injury. Eye internal injury, large intestine injury possible, degree of injury unknown. Then came Quinn's analysis of his mobility, and that was dependent on his legs. Severe calf tear, diagonal tear. Conclusion, right leg mobility severely restricted. Another critical injury had sharply reduced Quinn's ability to move. He had practically lost his right leg. After that was the turn of the injury Quinn was most worried about. Upper abdomen wound, no exit wound confirmed with severe blood loss. Punctured lung hindering breathing. Quinn was relieved that his heart wasn't injured. The closeness of the injury had been very stressful to him. The last injury was to his forearm and had slightly fractured his bone and had a flexor tendon, which had rendered his left hand's finger useless. Finally, Quinn closed his eyes, and his study and practice of healing magic came to use. A mix of blue and green light flashed inside and across his wounds and slowed down his blood loss. But the blood work wasn't over as Quinn's skill with blood magic came into play, and he mitigated the blood flow to the uninjured veins and arteries. The injuries are too serious for me to heal right now. I need to get out of here, decided Quinn thinking about his physical situation. His injuries were severe, and Quinn wasn't sure if he would be able to heal them on his own. He wanted to get out of the aquatic vault because apparition was disabled in here, meaning that if he failed to stabilize himself in here, Quinn wouldn't be able to call Polly to pop him to the hospital wing where Poppy could take him. While inside Hogwarts grounds, house elves could elf apparate inside or outside on their own, but if they had another being with them, they couldn't bring them out or in with them. Meaning that if Polly came to Hogwarts, she wouldn't be able to bring Quinn out of the castle grounds, but she was allowed to apparate him to any part of the castle that wasn't warded off to the house elves. Quinn wanted to get out of there before his condition degraded so that if he did fail to heal himself, he would have Polly pop him to the hospital wing. With grunts and groans of pain, Quinn conjured a stretcher to his side. After rolling onto the stretcher, Quinn stuck his body to the stretcher with magic. The stretcher was levitated and brought Quinn to the tunnel, and after raising itself vertically, the stretcher with Quinn attached to it entered the tunnel. The bubblehead charm covered Quinn's face to provide him oxygen inside water. Scene break. The stretcher with Quinn came out of the tunnel into the Great Lake. Water magic took over and raised Quinn above as he controlled the direction he wanted to go. Quinn strenuously looked to the side, hoping that the Kraken would notice him and carry him to the lakeshore so that he wouldn't have to use water magic to get out, but it seemed that the fates weren't with him today because the Kraken's eyes were closed and it seemed to be sleeping. Need to hurry, thought Quinn. He didn't stop to lament his bad luck. He immediately ramped up the water magic, which would have been difficult because of his current condition. But the negative emotions were very potent when it came to magic, and Quinn was solely channeling them to provide that extra juice. The water around him pushed him up, and Quinn zoomed to the lakeshore while a calm bubble of water protected him from any disturbance. Working through the pain, which Quinn hadn't numbed because it was helping him with a stronger connection to magic and kept him awake, Quinn came out to a portion of the shore with trees. He didn't want to be disturbed and wanted to work in peace. The stretcher laid itself on the ground, and immediately, Quinn started to heal himself. Very slowly, healing magic began to work on Quinn's body and started to knit the very inner portion of his injuries. Quinn knew that he wouldn't be able to completely heal himself and completely recover at the moment, he would need potions and multiple healing sessions for that. So, currently, Quinn's focus was to stabilize himself so that his wounds weren't life-threatening and he could move without degrading his injuries. 
With his eyes closed, Quinn worked healing charms and spells to slowly and carefully heal his injuries. But it seemed that Fate and Lady Luck definitely weren't at his side because Quinn felt a chill descend on him. Something that sucked seemed to want all the joy out of everything. Quinn opened his eyes, and through his tired eyes, saw half a dozen Dementors descend upon him, with more Dementors circling above in the distance. And from the looks of it, they too were coming down towards him. Ah, this is great. Just F King great. Spat out a tired and busy Quinn and stared at the six Dementors. A patroness was out of the question because Quinn was working with negative emotions, and right now, he was amid fixing his body. If he tried to use a patroness, the healing magic would be interrupted and further complicate his injuries. Panic increased, and even though he couldn't feel it, the annoying buzz in the back of his head got stronger. Quinn heavily sighed and murmured to himself. I didn't want to do this. I really don't want to do this. I don't want to dip into that. His eyes got a little sharper as he decided. But it is the best of all the choices I have. He didn't want Polly to come here and see him all injured with a horde of Dementors coming down to get him. If she saw this, Quinn was sure that his grandfather would pull him out of Hogwarts, and he wasn't ready for that. Not to mention there would be further consequences to his lifestyle. Quinn closed his eyes and firmly declared to himself. Do it, ask for it, and, hurry, we don't have much time. Then Quinn waited, waited for the thing he wanted to happen as he continued to heal himself. The chilling presence from the Dementors became colder, but just before the happiness-sucking demons sucked the joy out of him, warm and positive energy enveloped him, bringing a smile to Quinn's face. Excellent, smiled Quinn and opened his eyes to see a bright silver, translucent raven flying between him and the Dementors. The raven patroness turned towards Quinn and stared at him for a second before turning back towards the Dementors. Then raven flapped its wings fiercely, and as it did, the raven increased in size from a normal-sized small raven to an eagle-sized bird, but the size increase didn't end, and the raven continued to grow. Within a span of seconds, the small raven had grown to an elephant-sized behemoth of a bird. The silver light from the raven patroness was so bright that Quinn had to close his eyes to protect his eyes, but a small smile graced his face. Feeling relieved, Quinn went back to concentrating on healing. The elephant-sized raven flew up and towards the horde of more than a hundred dementors. The wraith-like dark creatures ran away fastly in all directions, doing their best to avoid the raven patroness and even the slightest silver light coming from it. The creatures that made beings cower were now fleeing in fear because of the silver guardian. After chasing away the Dementors, the Raven Patroness returned. It shrunk down to the size of a regular raven and flew circles around Quinn. Quinn opened his eyes as the healing magic stopped working. He was stabilized, no longer in life-threatening danger, and was healed enough to move around slowly without moving. Off you go, said Quinn and dispelled the Raven Patroness but not before saying, thank you for protecting me. The Patroness flapped its wing rapidly before it was dispelled by Quinn. Ugh, now I need to work this out, sighed Quinn as he got up from the ground with a grunt. This sucks. Quinn conjured a robe over his body and walked towards the castle as the sky dark, onsetting the night time. Dash asterisk asterisk dash asterisk asterisk dash asterisk. Chapter 104, Summons, Repayment, Negotiation Quinn entered the AID office limping. He had conjured a shirt and pants over his body and under his robes in the time he had traveled from the Great Lakes shore to the AID office. Other than his punctured lung, which he mostly had patched at the lake shore, most of Quinn's injuries were still raw. All the muscle wounds were being protected and being medically stabilized by magic. The fractured bone didn't lose any bone fragments, so Quinn was able to completely fix it. But the muscles were torn and ripped apart by the pressure jet. To fix them, Quinn needed to drink a muscle protein nutrient potion that would provide the body with the material to restore the muscles. Quinn slumped down in one of the client chairs and leaned into it before diving into his mind and recalled the information about his potion inventory. I don't have enough doses. Two standard dose vials won't work. He looked at the red workshop door and sighed, I will have to make it work for now. Quinn raised a single finger, and a painting on the wall levitated and from behind a rose gold key flew out. The rose gold key flew towards the red workshop door and entered the key slot before turning to open the door. This rose gold key was a spare as Quinn's clothes were still hidden near the lakeshore. Quinn had built detachable pockets that he attached to his clean robes every morning. The primary key was in one of those pockets, so Quinn had to use this spare key. The door lock unlocked with a click, and with an act of magic, Quinn manually opened the cylinder bar's lock system that kept the door extra secured in case someone found a key. After the door opened, two vials of dull, dark red potion flew out towards Quinn. Quinn grabbed one vial while the other one entered the conjured pants pocket. Uncorking the vial, Quinn drank the potion in one gulp and set down the empty vial on the table. He closed his eyes and felt the muscle protein nutrient potion immediately took effect. The potion provided the muscle protein nutrient to the body, and Quinn cast healing magic to utilize that concentrated intake of the nutrients. With the healing magic doing its work, Quinn got up from the client chair and moved to his bar stool behind the table. Opening the stationary drawer of his table, Quinn took out a sheet of black paper and a fountain pen with golden ink inside it. It was the same color scheme as the AID cards, gold on black. But before he used the pen and paper, Quinn opened another drawer and took out a fake silver sickle. He pumped magic into it. Previously, he hadn't wanted to risk diverting focus and magic because the injuries were severe, but now he was comfortable diverting magic and focus as his wounds were stabilized. The fake silver sickle transformed to say office on both sides. 
Quinn put the coin back into the drawer and turned his attention back to the black paper. Let's keep it simple and authoritative, said Quinn as he uncapped the pen and thought about what to write on the black paper. After forming the words and sentences in his mind, Quinn began writing. To Ms. Hermione Granger. Date, May 16, 1994. Subjects, summons for repayment. Ms. Granger, you are duly summoned and required to report at the AID office on the main corridor, West Sections, 5th floor, for repaying the debt owed to me for helping you in your time of need. You are required to appear within 30 minutes of receiving this letter. The moment you open the envelope this letter came in, I would be informed, and the clock would start. For your sake, please comply with the instructions to the point and without any delay. Regards. Q West. Proprietor. AID Consultations. This will do, nodded Quinn, folded the black paper into thirds and put it into a white envelope, and addressed it to Hermione. As he sealed the envelope, Quinn charmed the lip of the envelope in such a way that when it was opened, Quinn would know. As he completed the letter, the office door opened, and his assistant, Luna Lovegood, entered the room. You called, asked Luna as she skipped into the room. She raised her arm to show a leather and sterling silver bracelet on her wrist. The silver piece on the bracelet showed the words office on it. The sterling silver piece was charmed with the protean charm connecting the bracelet with the fake silver sickle. It was a way for Quinn to summon. Quinn raised the letter in his hand and asked. Yes, can you go to the library and hand this to Hermione Granger? She will most probably be there, but if she isn't, go to the Gryffindor common room and ask a Gryffindor to call Hermione Granger out. Unfortunately, Quinn didn't have recon on his person, or else he would have told Luna Hermione's precise location. But fortunately, Quinn had a lot of key people's regular routines memorized. Luna took out the envelope from Quinn and looked at the Hermione Granger written on it. Okay, shrugged Luna and put the envelope inside her robes. Luna, please make sure that she gets the envelope immediately and tell her that she is to open it immediately. You have to give it to her as soon as possible, insisted Quinn, as he only had a little over four hours before the window closed, and he wanted this to end within an hour or two. Also, after you give it to her, don't return to the office for today. When you go to dinner, tell Eddie and Marcus that I am busy and won't be attending the meal today. Tell them it isn't something to worry about and to not look for me. Luna tilted her head and seemed confused about why Quinn was asking these things. But the serious tone in his voice told her that she should just comply. She did stare at him observantly, but nothing seemed out of order. Now, go on and hurry, instructed Quinn. Luna nodded and exited the office to find Hermione Granger to hand over Quinn's letter to her. Quinn sighed in relief and dropped the glamour spell, revealing a slightly pale Quinn. Good thing I thought of disguising myself. He closed his eyes to concentrate on the healing magic to direct the healing process, waiting for Hermione to arrive. Scene break. As Quinn had predicted, Luna found Hermione in the library, reading away from a thick tome with brows furrowed in concentration. And even though she looked severe, Hermione was having a good time as she read the book. Hermione Granger. The mention of her name made Hermione look up from her book and notice a girl with blonde hair and silvery eyes looking at her, standing really close to the table, which surprised Hermione. Yes, asked Hermione tentatively. She recognized the girl in front of her and knew who Luna was. She had noticed the younger girl because she usually hung out with Quinn West's group of friends. Luna frowned at the tone and asked. You are Hermione Granger, right? Hermione blinked and nodded in response. Oh, good. I thought I found the wrong person. Luna took out the envelope that Quinn gave to her from robes and presented it to Hermione. This is for you. Hermione confusedly received the white letter envelope from Luna and read her name written in beautiful cursive calligraphy with gold ink. Who is this from? Asked Hermione. Something told her that the letter envelope wasn't from Luna. The letter is from Quinn, answered Luna. Quinn, the person who was sitting at the table with Hermione, reading her own books, spoke up. She had been listening to the conversation, but when Quinn came up, she joined the conversation. Quinn West. Luna looked at the person and saw a girl with red hair and green eyes, a sharp look in the girl's eyes as she stared at her. You are Ivy Potter. You are pretty, commented Luna, complimenting the girl. From what I know, there isn't another Quinn in Hogwarts. But yes, Quinn West. What does he want? Asked Ivy, briefly glancing at the letter in Hermione's hand. Luna shrugged her shoulders as she replied. I don't know. He just said to deliver the letter. She turned to Hermione and instructed, he said to open the letter immediately. And now I am done, so bye. After saying that, Luna turned and left without giving the two girls a chance. She would have stayed and talked to the two, but she had an article to write for Quibbler, and Quinn wanted Hermione to read the letter immediately, so she didn't want to delay that. Luna's abrupt exit surprised Ivy and Hermione, and they just stared at her back as she walked away. Only after Luna had disappeared from their sight did Ivy and Hermione look at each other with surprise. That was. I don't know what that was, commented Hermione, still taking in the meeting with eccentric Ravenclaw. Yes, it was rushed added Ivy and then pointed at the envelope in Hermione's hand. Open it. Let's see what he wants. Hermione opened the envelope and took out a thicker than usual black paper. This is definitely from him, said Hermione, immediately connecting the black sheet with the black AID cards. Her guess was strengthened when she saw the gold words upon unfolding the letter. Ivy watched as Hermione read the letter and noticed that her eyes widened almost immediately. What is it? What does it say? 
It is a summons for repayment. He is going to ask me to do something for him, just as he said he would, said Hermione, passing the black letter to Ivy for reading. I need to be there within 30 minutes, and he knows that I opened it. Read it. Hermione had always told Ivy not to worry about the incident as they couldn't change what had happened, and they would worry about it when Quinn asked them for repayment. But now that time had come, Hermione started to worry about what Quinn would ask from her. Ivy read the letter twice and then looked at Hermione. Let's go. I will come with you. She held the worried Hermione's hand and assured. I will be there for you. Don't worry. Hermione breathed and nodded, thankful for her best friend's support. Scene break. Quinn opened his eyes when he heard the door chime ring. He immediately put on a glamour so that everything seemed normal. It masked the pale skin with some exhaustion with magic, and Quinn looked no different from the norm. Hermione Granger and Ivy Potter entered the office with different expressions. Hermione had nervousness on her face which she was trying to hide whereas Ivy Potter had caution and vigilance flashing in her eyes. The two girls looked around the office, and the two couldn't get used to the fact that the AID office was lit up with white light coming from an unknown source instead of candle chandeliers hanging from the ceiling. Welcome, Ms. Granger, please come in, and I would be lying if I said I didn't expect you to tag along with her, Ms. Potter, sighed Quinn when he saw two people enter his office instead of one. Now that you two are here, please take seats so that we can start. We have much work to do. Ivy didn't reply and followed Quinn's instructions and sat down in the client chair, with Hermione sitting in the other chair. Quinn raised his hand towards Hermione with palm up. Hermione looked at the hand with confusion, but a split second later, she understood the meaning, retrieved the letter Luna had given her and placed it on Quinn's hand. Quinn gripped the letter and threw it above his head behind him. The letter was incinerated into nothingness and smoke immediately after. He ignored the astonished expression from the Gryffindor girls and started. So we all know why I have called you here. To repay the debt, answered Hermione shortly. She glanced at Ivy, who was staring at Quinn, who wasn't paying any attention to Ivy. You are correct. And before we start, I can see that you are nervous. So I would like to reassure you that what I am about to ask will affect nobody other than myself. What I am trying to convey is that your lives won't be any different from before you received the letter today. You can pretend that nothing happened, and it won't make any difference. Ivy narrowed her eyes, Quinn's words didn't reassure her one bit. What's the task? She would decide if the task would affect people after listening to what Quinn had to say. Quinn locked eyes with Hermione and opened his mouth to say a phrase that revealed a lot. I need the time turner. Hermione and Ivy's eyes widened to the size of saucers when the words came out of Quinn's mouth. Tea time turner? W what do you mean? I don't understand, stuttered Hermione, trying very hard to pretend to be clueless. Ivy, on her side, closed her eyes when she heard the shakiness in Hermione's voice. The obvious yet poor attempt to hide didn't help one bit. That stutter reveals everything, Ms. Granger. You need to practice lying if you want to fool anyone. A ghost of a smile graced Quinn's lips. Ms. Granger, you have been attending classes for 12 subjects, without special circumstances, there is no way you would have been able to attend all those classes. You have to understand that 120.w.ls are rare but not unprecedented. A lot of to-be head boys and head girls have attempted and succeeded in accomplishing this feat but the difference between them and you is that those people didn't sign up for all the subjects. Whereas you, you signed up for every subject class, and from what I have gathered, you attend every single subject. It wasn't compulsory to sign up for all classes to take O.W.L exams. In theory, a student could give all 12 O.W.L exams without attending a single session of all subjects. Most of the students who got 12 O.W.L.S. did exactly that. Hermione rubbed her temple as she asked with a sigh, but how did you know that I was using a time turner? Time turners weren't mainstream knowledge, it weren't the first thing that popped into one's mind when thinking about Hermione's situation. Even when Ivy Potter noticed something weird about Hermione and noticed that her timetable didn't make sense. It took Ivy to pry the answer off of Hermione to know how she managed to attend classes from 12 subjects, Ivy wouldn't have figured it out on her own. Most people, when hearing about your situation, wouldn't think about it if they aren't close to you. Most people would just sigh thinking about the load that you were taking and then move on with their life. Quinn pointed at himself and continued. Unfortunately or fortunately, I am not like most people. When I heard what you were doing because I am a busy person and have a strict time management schedule, I immediately thought about how you were doing this. And one day, I decided to investigate, and after some days of eliminating multitudes of viable and non-viable scenarios, I was able to figure out how you were doing this. The last remaining theory was a time-turner. Then Quinn decided to plug an event that would strengthen his made-up argument. Do you remember the first day of school when you and Harry Potter were called out to Professor McGonagall's office by her? Hermione nodded as that was the day she got the information about the time-turner. I understood why Harry Potter and I were there, but you didn't have to be there, so while investigating, that thought popped into my mind. It made me assume that Professor McGonagall assisted you in some way, that you didn't find a way on your own, and that made the search radius a lot shorter. Professor McGonagall is a busy person and wouldn't be able to help you out every hour, so I was able to deduce that you were using a magical item from that. Hermione and Ivy sat in their seats and watched as Quinn went on to state surprising insights about how he was able to narrow his final guess to a time-turner, all while keeping an expression that seemed to appear that what he did wasn't anything special. 
And that is how you got the time turner, but enough about this, let's come to why I have called you here, explained Quinn before putting on his business face and stating his demands. I want to go back in time. You have the means to accomplish that and will provide me with the time turner. No, came Hermione's immediate answer. Lending out her time turner wasn't an option in Hermione's mind. Once Ivy had asked to take the tag along because she wanted to see how it felt, but Hermione had put that idea down before Ivy could finish a single sentence. I understand your apprehension. The Ministry has tight control over time tuners, I assume that Professor McGonagall got your time turner from the Ministry. You are only allowed to use it only for your studies and nothing else, stated Quinn, knowing that he would face some resistance. But as I told you, what I will do while back in time wouldn't affect anyone but me, my actions are extremely isolated and won't affect anyone. The only people who even know that something happened are already in this room. Quinn could still see the resistance and unwillingness on Hermione's face, so he decided to give her another piece of reassurance that could possibly convince her to allow him to time travel. Ms. Granger, how about this? You and Ms. Potter here can come with me. I won't go alone, and you can see firsthand what I do while in the past. If you think I am doing something that you aren't comfortable with, you can ask me to stop, and I will give you my word that I will stop. He gauged Hermione's expression and thought as he waited for her response. Don't make me stun you and steal the time turner. I don't want to erase your memories. I would have to erase Luna's memories, Eddie's, and Marcus's to tie loose ends, and I don't want that. Luna had delivered the letter to Hermione, and Quinn had instructed her to inform Eddie and Marcus that he would miss the meal. So to effectively tie all loose ends, he would have to erase that Luna was ever called into the office and asked to deliver the letter. And by now, she would have met Eddie and Marcus, relaying the information, so he would also have to erase their memories to complete the erasure of the entire incident. Hermione took a while to make her decision. Ivy Potter sat by her side, silent, this was Hermione's decision, and if Hermione wanted some advice, Ivy would offer it, but not before asking. Ivy had listened to the entire conversation, and if she was in Hermione's place, she too wouldn't have been comfortable allowing Quinn to go back in the past. But the conditions that Quinn was putting forward were favorable to them. If she didn't have a choice to refuse, then Ivy would agree to Quinn's demand, given that he followed through with his promises. I agree with your demands. All three of us will go jump back to the past, declared Hermione with a half-resigned and half-determined expression. Quinn smiled and responded. Excellent. Dash asterisk asterisk dash asterisk asterisk dash asterisk. Quinn West, MC, negotiating a deal, tick tock, tick tock, tick tock. Hermione Granger, frequent time traveler, holds the only time turner currently in Hogwarts. Ivy Potter, moral support, vigilantly watching Quinn's every offer. Alan L, editor, watching everything unfolding while eating popcorn, Omega. Fiction only reader, author, nanny, chapter 105, jumping back in time excellent, smiled Quinn. The tough and first part of the problem was done. Now he only needed to get the straightforward part over with. I have done some research with the time turner, but you are the authority here, tell me, how should we do this? Hermione Granger was anything but uncertain. When she decided to do something, she went forward with composure, focus, and without second guessing her decisions. Now that she had agreed to Quinn's demands, her previous hesitations were put aside. She put her hand inside her shirt and pulled out a sparkling necklace that had an hourglass with blue sand. Oh, that is shiny, commented Quinn. Now that the difficult part was over, he was much relaxed, so carefree comments flowed out. Ivy and Hermione looked up from the time turner and saw that Quinn was closely observing the time turner with a smile on his face. Time turners that are issued by the Ministry of Magic have an hour reversal charm placed onto them. They had a limit of traveling back a maximum of five hours, which is the determined safety limit to the person and the fabrics of time itself, explained Hermione before asking Quinn a question. So, how long do you need to go in time, because if it is more than five hours, then we are already over before we start. Quinn knew that because of his knowledge, and that was why he had hurried to call Hermione. If there wasn't a time limit, Quinn would have waited till he was fully recovered. I want to go a little under three hours back in time. I see, then it's fine. This time turner turns back time in hours, meaning that we will go back three hours in time, nodded Hermione. Next, we need a place where we can't be seen. Somewhere we won't be disturbed. We need to find a place that has been empty for the last five hours, conveyed Hermione, another rule about time turners. Professor McGonagall has given me a key to one of the deserted and unused classrooms that I use when jumping back in time. Quinn pointed his hand towards the office as he said, I knew that, so I have taken measures to ensure that we won't be disturbed in here. No one will be coming here today. I will lock the door, and just to be extra careful, we will start here. Quinn pointed at the workshop as he finished. Ivy and Hermione looked at the workshop door and noticed that the door was different. Especially Ivy, who noticed that the new door looked much sturdier than before. Yes, the door is new. I had to make another one after our previous altercation. You won't be able to break it as easily as you did before, chuckled Quinn as he read their thoughts from their expressions. The two girls twitched after hearing Quinn's remark. Hermione retrieved her eyes from the red door and nodded. This will do. Now, before we go back, where are we going? We will be going to the woods near the Hogsmeade station, near the lakeside. As I told you, my actions are going to be extremely isolated, and the location is the reason for that isolation. What are you going to do? 
Quinn shook his head and spoke, I will tell you after we make the jump and reach the woods. Ivy narrowed her eyes at Quinn's refusal to tell the details, but because Hermione didn't say anything, she kept quiet. Well, let's get this over with, sighed Hermione, while guessing that asking Quinn again would be a waste of time and effort. The boy in front of her always had a shroud of mystery around him, and she didn't think that the shroud would come off today. Good, follow me so we can get started, said Quinn as he stood up from his barstool. He took out his fake wand and pointed it at the office door, melding the door and frame together. The two Gryffindor girls stood up and followed after Quinn as he pushed open the red workshop door. Quinn closed the door after everyone was inside. Last time, when Ivy was in the workshop, it was dark because she didn't know how to turn on the lights, but this time with Quinn with them, the workshop was brightly lit, and everything was clearly visible for them to see. Hermione and Ivy watched with wide eyes, taking in the things that they could see. There was so much stuff in the room that the variety stunned Ivy and Hermione. Ms. Granger, let's get going. I would like to get started quickly, so we can get this over with quickly, spoke Quinn to the girls, who were occupied looking around. Yes. Come closer to me, said Hermione as she pulled on the chain of the necklace with the time turner. Then, the chain expanded. It actually kept on expanding until its length satisfied Hermione. Get under the chain such that it is surrounding all three of us. Ivy and Quinn walked closer and lifted the chains over their heads to walk inside the circle. The redhead girl and black-haired boy looked at each other with their vivid green and stone-gray eyes as they stood in close proximity. Quinn slightly smiled as he looked down towards the shorter girl while Ivy stared up with a stern, non-nonsense face. You look like Daphne, right now, commented Quinn suddenly and smiled when Ivy's face twitched. His objective had been fulfilled. Hermione looked at the two and cleared her throat, and asked. Are you sure? Three hours. Yes, three hours will do. We'll be back here by the end of these three hours. He looked at Hermione and added, we should hurry because three people just entered the office. Quinn pointed at the glass wall. Hermione's eyes widened as she immediately understood what Quinn meant by his word. The three people that entered the office were the ones from the future. She immediately turned the hourglass timepiece thrice, triggering the time turner and slipping through the sands of times. The bright workshop dissolved. Quinn had the sensation that he was flying very fast, backward. A blur of colors and shapes rushed past him, his ears were pounding, he kept calm and observed the phenomenon through all his senses. And then he felt solid ground beneath his feet, and everything came into focus again. Quinn stood next to Hermione and Ivy inside the dark workshop. There was no light because there weren't any windows, and the rune lights were not turned on. Quinn turned his neck slightly to adjust the chain of the hourglass timepiece cutting into his neck. We've gone back in time, Hermione whispered, lifting the chain off and looking at Ivy and Quinn's figures appeared in the darkness. We went three hours back. Excellent. Let's get going. It will take longer than usual for us to get to the woods, said Quinn as he walked towards the workshop door. Huh, what do you dash? Ivy asked what Quinn was talking about when she noticed a clearly visible limp in Quinn's stride that was previously missing. Why are you limping? Quinn opened the workshop door and turned his face back to look at Ivy to state in a voice that made it seem that he was saying something obvious, I am injured. The limp wasn't there before we jumped back in time, chimed Hermione as she looked at Quinn's feet. I was being careful, but now that we are here, I can tell you, said Quinn as he entered the office. The girls followed as his voice became faint. I got injured, and we are going to make it so that I don't get injured further. Ivy and Hermione looked at each other and followed, who kept walking with the limp in his step. You got injured in the woods, questioned Ivy, trying to get information from Quinn. Kind of. Yeah, I got injured near the woods, said Quinn as the three exited the office and the door locked itself. Ivy watched as Quinn looked around the corridor with an uncomfortable expression. What happened? Quinn briefly glanced at Ivy before going back to look at the corridor. We have to make sure that we aren't seen. We aren't part of this time till the three hours pass, we don't belong to this time just yet. So, I would like to not be seen until the time after we return to the office after three hours. To make sure that this entire operation remained isolated and contained as much as possible, Quinn wanted that three of them to not be seen. Ivy and Hermione understood Quinn's point of view. Hermione looked at Ivy, who looked at her, and the two best friends talked with their eyes behind Quinn's back. After a few seconds, Ivy sighed and nodded. I have the Marauder's map on me. We can use that, said Ivy looking at Quinn's back, who turned to face Ivy and locked eyes with her. Really? Finally, some luck. Then let's use the map. It will make our job much easier. I guess your tagging along is paying off. The map alternated between the Potter siblings every day, and it turned out that today was Ivy's turn. She took out the map from her robes and activated the original inspiration for Recon with the secret phrase. I solemnly swear I am up to no good. The ink appeared on the old parchment as Ivy unfolded the map and manually looked for their position. My Recon has a voice activated, auto-locator, thought Quinn proudly. Ivy found their position, and as she did, Quinn noticed that the map only showed Hermione and Ivy, Quinn was missing from the map. It seems I'm still not traceable with the map, smiled Quinn as he looked at the map. That makes me happy. We tried to fix it, but it didn't work, spat Ivy as he lightly glared at Quinn. That makes me happier, laughed Quinn at her tone. Let's talk about this later, reminded Hermione, who was the only one experienced with time travel. She had gotten used to managing time, and her two companions were wasting precious time. 
Ah, yes, we should hurry. With my limp, it will take us longer to get there, nodded Quinn before motioning Ivy to step forward. If you would be so kind as to lead the way, Pathfinder. Ivy ignored Quinn and stepped forward to lead the way, while keeping an eye on the map to see the people in their surroundings. Quinn, who was following Ivy, sneakily and silently cast a group disillusionment charm that worked on Quinn's understanding of physical illusions and light manipulation to turn the trio invisible. It was high-quality magic, and it was much better than his previous work this year as an invisible vigilante. The fact that he had been noticed prompted Quinn to figure out a better spell that wouldn't become vulnerable while moving. The general disillusionment charms worked on light manipulation, so Quinn upped the quality of light manipulation and beyond by adding aspects of physical illusions to provide another layer of depth to the stealth. The three eventually made their way towards the woods, taking the party around three quarters of an hour to get to the point that Quinn wanted. All right, we are here. We are going to make camp here and wait till the event starts, informed Quinn. He took out his fake wand for show and transmuted the ground to rise up to form three plateaus before transforming them into stone. Quinn plopped himself down on one of the flat stones and gestured to the girls to take their seats as well. Ivy and Hermione looked to their surroundings and saw that they were barely inside the woods, which had the Great Lake on one side and the Hogsmeade Station on the other. From the way Quinn was sitting, they could deduce that whatever was about to happen was going to happen at the Great Lake's side. After the two finally sat down on the transfigured stones, Quinn spoke up, We have time before I have to start working, so to pass the time, I would like to make some things clear. Ivy and Hermione glanced at each other while thinking that Quinn was about to tell them what was about to happen, but what followed differed completely from what happened. First, Ms. Potter, addressed Quinn. He took a short pause before continuing. You were at the wrong place at the wrong time. I was going through a bad time when you came across me. And well, you know what followed. Ivy silently stared at Quinn with a totally expressionless face. It was clear she was using a clumency. She knew that Quinn was talking about the polyjuice incident. If times had been better, even though I wouldn't have condoned your actions I would have simply ignored you and moved along minding my own business. But the circumstances lead to what happened. And I truly and from the bottom of my heart am sorry that I threatened you and your family. It was true, Quinn would have ignored Ivy in Daphne's form and would have walked away because of his then reluctance to get involved with the events. The sin curse had decreased those inhibitions, and he vaulted into the incident with a particular savageness. Emotions could be peaked from behind Ivy's acclumency barrier as surprise appeared on her face. She wasn't expecting this from Quinn when he said that he wanted to pass the time. Next, I don't really mind you breaking into Professor Snape's ingredient inventory to get the potion ingredients. To me, it just showed that you guys were resourceful. I probably would have just mail-ordered the ingredients, but I'm sure you didn't have that option. Quinn knew he was saying that he didn't mind identity theft and breaking and entry, but the truth was that he truly didn't mind it. Quinn was what you called a serial legilimens, which meant that he regularly used legilimency. Every mealtime while he was in the Great Hall, Quinn would use legilimency to peek into the unsuspecting mind of numerous students. Tens of students had no idea that their minds were being read while they chatted and ate their meals. In his second year, Quinn had drugged Ron Weasley to get information out of him, which was again a tremendous violation of privacy. His first meeting with Ginny Weasley had turned into a walk where he tried to go through the girl's recent life. He had practically hacked into a computer system to get the private passwords of numerous accounts. Recon was just that as he even had the passwords to the professor's private quarters that were practically like their apartments. So when Quinn said that he didn't mind the stuff that he had held against them, he was speaking the truth. Nonetheless, I vehemently oppose you breaking into my office. That wasn't cool at all. The reasoning that you girls based your opinion were pardon my language idiotic. Hermoyne was about to speak, but Quinn stopped her and continued, I know what I am saying is highly hypocritical, but the truth of the matter is that I am somewhat of a hypocrite. Another example of Quinn's hypocrisy was his thoughts about the Lockhart incident. He felt that Lockhart got his punishment but didn't like the fact that it had come from himself, Quinn would have been fine if it came from anyone else than him. And that was classic hypocritical behavior. When Quinn stopped and Hermione said what she was planning to say, you know that what you said makes things worse. I know, but the thing is, what I said is the honest truth. The only reason I am telling you guys this is because, at that time, I was going through a tough time, and telling you guys just lets me get a load off my chest. Hermione Granger and Ivy Potter stared at Quinn, who had an honest smile on his face. Both of them knew what Quinn said was in some ways a lot worse, but the tone and delivery of his words made them confused if they should take it positively or negatively. If you are sorry, then why did you call us to repay? Asked Ivy. She had dropped her acclumency. Hmm? I said that I didn't appreciate you breaking into my office. That thing is still pretty much entirely on the table. And while I never wanted to ask you guys to repay the debt, Ms. Granger's debt was my best option. If I had something that would help me resolve this on my own, then I wouldn't have given her a single second of thought. Quinn shrugged and referenced. I praised you guys for being resourceful because I like to think I am resourceful as well. This was just me being resourceful. So no hard feelings, all right. Quinn was now done with what he wanted to tell them. He had said everything he wanted to say, he had apologized for threatening the Potter family, about staining James Potter's reputation, getting them expelled, among other things. He didn't mean any of those things, and those kinds of threats would only be true if they had done something that Quinn couldn't reverse or get out of easily. 
because even though his grandfather and Leo would support him and he would inadvertently gain the support of the Dark Faction, the whole spiel would be a tremendous pain in the ass for Quinn. The party of three sat in silence, with Quinn monitoring the lakeshore while Ivy and Hermione contemplated the words that Quinn had spoken to them. After half an hour, Quinn suddenly stood up from his stone and garnered the attention of his companions. It is time, said Quinn as he stared at the lakeshore. Quinn's abrupt stand surprised Ivy and Hermione, who were sitting silently for the past half hour. They followed his eyesight, and their eyes widened in shock when they saw a heavily injured Quinn West come out of the lake. They were sitting at a distance, but even from there, both could clearly see the wounds on Quinn's body. The gashes on his body were deep and broad, and only their distance from the past Quinn dissociated them from the gory scene. W what happened to you, exclaimed Ivy as she removed her eyes from the past Quinn to their companion, Quinn. I got injured and am currently in the process of healing myself, replied Quinn, who had his eyes fixed on his past self. Should we help you out? What should we do? You should have told us about this earlier, rapid fired Hermione as she frantically looked back and forth from both Quinns. Quinn raised his arm to motion them to calm down. You two don't have to do anything. Please remember that you are only here to keep an eye on me. You two simply need to stay put. I will take care of everything. Hermione and Ivy had stood up from their seats and were now looking at the past Quinn. Both waited for Quinn to do something, but he just stood still and kept on staring at his past self. Why aren't you doing something? You are going to die, exclaimed Ivy, anxiously looking at the injured past Quinn. With every second that Quinn didn't respond, she grew more uneasy, and after some time, she couldn't hold it back anymore. You are mad? I'm going to help him. He is going to die. And stepped forward, fully intending to help the past Quinn. Quinn glanced at Ivy and sighed. With a slight twitch of his finger, a white dome force field appeared around Ivy, causing her to halt within the confines of the magic. There was a sudden and sharp jump in tension between the group. Ivy threw a wary look at the dome around as she took out her wand. Hermione, who was still standing near her stone, also took out her wand in apprehension. Miss Potter, nothing will happen to him. He will not die from his wounds. The fact that I am standing here is proof that he will come out of this alive, spoke Quinn, attempting to pacify Ivy as he threw a glance towards Hermione. He is currently healing his wounds. I'm proficient in healing wounds. I'd like you to calm down. I assure you that he won't die. Neither Ivy nor Hermione at this point knew how time worked, so it wasn't unusual that they would be stimulated by the sight of a badly cut up person. People with lawful good alignments can be a hassle sometimes, thought Quinn. But he was a little surprised, even after what had happened between them, Ivy would readily try to save him. The force field around Ivy disappeared, freeing her from the confines. And please try to remain quiet. I had to cast a silencing ward around us to stop the voice from reaching him. We need to complete this stealthily, instructed Quinn before going back to observing his past self. Hermione gingerly walked to Ivy and stood by her friend. Did you notice him casting a ward? Because I didn't. Ivy shook her head in response, her eyes locked on Quinn, who didn't look worried at all. Do you have any idea what is happening? Why isn't he doing anything? Didn't he say that he wanted to reduce his injuries? Why isn't he helping his past self? I don't know Dash started Hermione, but her voice came to an abrupt stop. Ivy watched as Hermione's face took an expression of horrified shock. What? Spoke Ivy and turned towards where Hermione was looking and saw the thing that had Hermione stuck in frightening shock. A flying tornado of dark cloaks descended from the dark evening sky. Hundreds of gliding wraiths gathered above the past Quinn, circling in the sky as some of them silently flew down towards the injured boy. The hundreds of creatures had a grim effect on the surroundings as Ivy and Hermione felt the temperature drop around them. It's time. They heard Quinn speak as he calmly looked at the hundreds of hooded cloaks nearing his past self. The Dementors are here. Dash asterisk asterisk dash asterisk asterisk dash asterisk. Quinn West, MC, I am a hypocrite of a high order. Ivy Potter, Pathfinder, Lawful Good. Hermione Granger, Tensed, What is Happening? Fiction Only Reader, Author, All Right, Dementors, 3 2 1. Go, 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 Alan L, Editor, This is Getting Interesting. Smiley Face, Chapter 106, Dementor Horde, Time Magic, Free Will The Dementors Are Here. Quinn, Ivy, and Hermione watched a horde of more than a hundred Dementors descend upon the injured past Quinn. Ivy's eyes went back and forth between Quinn and the scene near the lakeside. She stood frozen, troubled by the scene, every second, her nervousness and impatience grew stronger. She turned to Quinn and outright screamed. What in the world are you waiting for? Do something? You are going to die. She knew that Quinn could cast a patroness, as Hermione had told her about Quinn's patroness demonstration in McGonagall's office. It isn't time yet. He has to say it for me to move. I need his permission to act. Without it, I'm not going to act, declared Quinn, still staring at his past self with unblinking eyes. What? 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 Thundered Ivy as she incredulously gawked at Quinn. She couldn't understand what was going on in Quinn's mind. It was then that the past Quinn spoke some words that were audible to the group. Do it? Ask for it. And hurry? We don't have much time. Ivy, who was thundering at Quinn, went silent. What did he say? She asked. He said, do it. Ask for it. And hurry. We don't much time. Hermione repeated the words said by past Quinn and glanced at Quinn, who had finally raised his fake wand. Not the most accurate wording. I already asked and am already here. 
But I will let it slide since you're injured, chuckled Quinn, and immediately after, a silver glow of light burst out his fake wand. Ivy and Hermione had seen Quinn's patroness during the train ride to Hogwarts, and at that time, they were only able to identify it as a bird, but this time, they clearly saw the form of Quinn's patroness. A raven, muttered Hermione, watching the silver bird fly towards the past Quinn. Previously, they were stunned because of Quinn's lack of action. But now they were astonished as they gawked at the small-sized bird growing into an elephant-sized raptor, who chased away the horde of dementors that numbered greater than a hundred. I'm still injured, sighed Quinn internally as he looked at the elephant-sized raven patroness. If I wasn't injured, I could have ramped it up to the size of a giant. After the raven patroness chased away the dementors, Quinn made it fly around his past self for protection. It's done. Now, we have to wait for him to get up and go to the office, sighed Quinn as he plopped back down on his stone. The two girls turned their heads from the guardian patroness to Quinn. Their eyes widened another fraction after they saw a paler than before Quinn. Quinn took out the dull, dark red, muscle protein nutrient potion vial from his pocket and gulped it down to replenish his body with another dose. Sit down, he will take some time to heal himself and go back to the castle, called out Quinn to the stunned girls. What did you just drink? Questioned Ivy, eyeing Quinn's hand, which pocketed the empty vial. Quinn briefly pulled up his left sleeve in response to show the girls a laceration, and inside the wound, they saw the muscle fibers constantly twitching. The wound was covered quickly, after which Quinn explained. I'm still not healed. What is happening to him happened to me a few hours ago. I couldn't heal the wounds of this level in the time I had. On that note, I need to prepare some Ditani to make sure that these don't scar, thought Quinn. Quinn was still relatively new to healing magic, and even though he was miles better than the people who had studied with the time he had, Quinn still couldn't heal the wounds of this level without leaving scars. Hermione walked back to her stone, and after sitting down, asked, Can you please tell me what is going on? I need to understand what is happening. Ivy had also sat down and was looking at Quinn with a look that asked the same question. All right, let's start with a question from my side, and this is open to both of you. What is the greatest magic of all? Asked Quinn with a smile on his face. Friendship. Love. Quinn put on an off-put face as if repelled by their answer. After seeing that expression, the two girls felt embarrassed. What the hell is wrong with you two? He looked at Hermione and spoke. Friendship. Friendships break all the damn time. You won't even talk to most of the people you know from Hogwarts after you graduate. Then turning to Ivy, Quinn spoke in the same incredulous tone. If a mother and son are iced in an alleyway by a psychotic murderer, it isn't because they didn't love each other enough. That is ridiculous. Love is love. Magic is magic. Even if you are talking about the strongest emotion that can stimulate magic, Ms. Potter, all emotions are the same. Love is just easier to access because of how we humans perceive emotions. Then what is the answer? Asked Ivy, feeling embarrassed of Quinn's expression and tone. Chronomancy, exclaimed Quinn. The greatest magic of all is chronomancy, the magic of time itself. If a person can manipulate time, then they are invincible beyond anything. Every change in the world is in reference to time. Life and death are just states that come with time. One moment, you are alive, but the next, you can be dead. But if you control the time, you can control life and death. Everything can be at your fingertips with time. If you look into the future, you'll know what is to come. Nothing would ever be able to phase you because you can already see it coming. Even if you can't solve something, you have the ability to rewind time until you are successful. If you can slow, reverse, fast forward time, then there is nothing you can't accomplish. Quinn raised his right hand wide while keeping his left hand down to reduce movement. And right now, we are manipulating time to our advantage. He looked at Hermione and continued, something Ms. Granger has been doing for the entire year. But with such great power comes danger equal to the advantages. Time is dangerous, complex, chaotic, and not something to be messed with without proper understanding and knowledge. You must know what you are trying to accomplish and how you want to accomplish that, said Quinn with an earnest tone, enunciating his every word so that they would be clear and intelligible. So you understand time? You know what you are doing, questioned Ivy. Quinn slightly chuckled at the questions. Oh, no, not at all. I don't understand time. It's too complex for me to even get into the basics. But I know what I'm doing. I know enough to pull off what I'm trying to do, or maybe not. Yeah, I'm sure I don't know enough. Hermione and Ivy looked at each other with skepticism. Quinn's words didn't actually inspire confidence in him. Quinn continued to explain, ignoring their expression. I can't manipulate time with magic, the time turner takes care of that. I just needed to make sure that I keep my presence as little as possible to reduce my influence on the timeline. This is why I insisted we must be hidden to the limit. No interaction with anyone after making the jump back in time makes sure that we have a minimum effect. Now, do any of you know of the closed loop theory or causal loop theory of time? Asked Quinn. The two girls shook their heads. They didn't know the answer. A causal loop is a temporal proposition in which, by means of time travel, a sequence of events is among the causes of another event, which is, in turn, among the causes of the first mentioned event. In simpler, no, just in other words, when a future event is the cause of a past event, which in turn is the cause of the future event. Seeing that the girls were still confused, Quinn rolled out the current situation as an example. Let's take this current situation as a reference and an example. 
I got injured, and while I healed myself, a horde of Dementors swarmed around me to prey upon my soul. In that moment of desperation, I called upon a future version of myself to help me out from this situation by protecting me with a patroness, explained Quinn and then pointed to Hermione. All of this was only possible because I had the knowledge and means to procure a time tuner from Ms. Granger. Without her time turner, it wouldn't have been possible. Moving on, a future version of mine came back in time and helped me out, allowing me to live past this unfortunate situation. Quinn was cut off, and Hermione raised a doubt. So you are saying that time works in this closed loop theory? It made sense because what she had been doing was like this, but from what Quinn said, time was supposed to be complex and not something as simple as this. Oh, no, of course not. I wish it was something so simple. Professor McGonagall must have told you about the catastrophic events that unleash with time turners, said Quinn and then gave some examples. Killing their past or future selves by mistake or altering one's life path in such a drastic fashion that it can result in temporal anomalies such as unbirths. And these scenarios are anything but closed loops. Did you know? Once, the unspeakables down in the ministry, sent back one of their people 500 years into the past. She stayed there for five days, and when the unspeakables finally pulled her back, she died because it turned out that if you sent some back and forth in time, they aged the time they travel back. The unspeakable aged rapidly and died because of old age. And a lot more consequences that really caused more problems. Quinn scoffed before he pointed out the restrictions placed upon the time turners. The five-hour restrictions might be due to safety reasons, but believe me when I say this, we can do substantial damage to the timeline in mere five hours. Ivy and Hermione didn't know Quinn well enough, but after what they had seen today, both were sure that he wasn't jesting. Coming back to the point, what I did was create an artificial closed loop. I created circumstances that would keep the series of events as close to the actual events. By doing this, I would reach the same place where my future self did when saving me. This time Ivy had a question, and from the tone, the subject irked her. Doesn't this mean that there is no free will? Once the cycle starts, you will have to follow the course that was set for you. Quinn ever so faintly smiled and turned his gaze towards his past self. You may be correct, Ms. Potter. This type of time travel doesn't allow free will. Once started, every Quinn West will have to follow the path of events that was set for them. He turned back to Ivy and asked. But I did have free will in this case. The events that you saw are exactly the same as I encountered. Look back to the events and think about when my free will came into play. Both the girls went into retrospection about the recent events. It took a couple of minutes before Ivy came up with an answer. When you refused to move until you heard the words from your past self. Is that the free will you are talking about, opined Ivy, though not sure if her answer was correct or not. Ding dong ding, nodded Quinn and sang as the answer was correct. I know myself better than anyone else. So I know that in this situation, every Quinn West would use this method because all of them would think this is the best choice. But even though they know that, it is their choice, their free will to start the loop despite knowing that they would have to continue onto a path that won't give them any more free will. But what if your past didn't make the same choice? What would happen then? Asked Hermione. Quinn shook his head as he answered. I don't know. Maybe we would have disappeared, our existence erased forever. Maybe we would have stayed here and we would have two sets of Quinn West, Hermione Granger, and Ivy Potter. Most probably, the unspeakables in the ministry would detect the disturbance in time and then hunt us down to somehow fix things up. Quinn was sure that if the past himself that was healing himself right now didn't go back in time, around the same time he traveled here, then the unspeakables would notice some form of agitation in time. And you still did this, asked Ivy in disbelief at Quinn's decision to go through this. Yes, I did. I told you, didn't I, Ms. Potter? You need to know what and how you are doing things, and if you know those things, the results will turn out how you want them to be. Every step I took was to ensure that things went smoothly, declared Quinn with confidence and certainty about his preparation. And the fact that it worked for my future self, who helped me out, shows that it is possible for me. But your past self still hasn't gone back to the past? What if he decides not to go back? What if Ivy and I refuse to go back with you? Questioned Hermione, as from what Quinn said, all three of them need to go back in time. Oh, he will go back, Ms. Granger. He knows the fact that I am here and that the time turner only allows one-way travel. My past self owes me for saving him, he will repay me by exiting this time, so I can take his place, laughed Quinn merrily and looked the two girls straight in the eye. You thought that I only placed others in my debt? Oh, no, even me, Quinn West, owes myself a debt. He will now go to another time and get another Quinn West under his debt, who will pay the debt, and the cycle will continue. Quinn straightened up and softly smiled with superiority flashing in his eyes. This might sound corny but, one mountain cannot contain two tigers. There can't exist two Quinn West at the same time. There can only be one and, in this timeline, it will be me. As much as Quinn loved himself, he wasn't on board with another one of him existing alongside him. Ms. Granger, tell me, why do you think I brought you both here? Quizzed Quinn. I know you are expecting to give you a different answer than us trying to stop you from doing things we are uncomfortable with, presumed Hermione. Smart girl. Yes, I brought you two here for a reason beneficial to me. Give it a thought, smiled Quinn, curious if they would be able to figure it out. While Hermione and Ivy thought of the answer, Quinn thought something inside his mind. Why am I giving them all these questions? I should just tell them the answers. 
Whatever, this is going well. Quinn knew he let people ask questions to control the flow of information. But today, he was asking them questions and guiding them to the answers. I knew that there was a personal angle, commented Ivy, as her eyes narrowed a fraction. But I can't figure it out. What is it? Quinn smiled before looking at Hermione to see if she had an answer, but the holder of Time Turner 2 didn't have an answer. Quinn thought back to the time he was thinking about stealing the Time Turner. Even though he thought of doing that, Quinn knew that Hermione would be coming with him. Ivy coming with them was decided the moment she decided to step into the office. He wasn't going to let them stay with the knowledge of what he was doing. All right then, I will tell you. The reason I proposed the idea of you two coming along with me was that I wanted to turn you two into accomplices, revealed Quinn. He wanted them to know what position they were currently in. I was determined to get the time turner from you, Ms. Granger. And when you decided to allow the use of a ministry-restricted artifact, given to you for education purposes, for something not even closely related to education made you an accessory to a crime. But when you made the decision to accompany me, your status jumped to an accomplice. Hermione's eyes widened because she knew that allowing Quinn to use the time turner could get in her trouble. Hearing that her original reasoning of making sure Quinn didn't do damage had turned against her. Quinn turned to Ivy and told the redhead about her contribution. Ms. Potter, if you, on a side note, didn't accompany me, you would be, at first, what we can call an abettor, someone who allowed the crime to happen, although didn't help in the crime. Now though, you turned into an accomplice by accompanying me back in time. While Hermione's jump was from an accessory to an accomplice, Ivy's jump was wider, as she turned from an abettor to an accomplice. The reason Quinn allowed them to come with him so readily was that he wanted to implicate them with him. So, if a time came where the two girls were feeling loose-lipped, they would remember that the secret they were about to slip could get them in trouble. I'm sorry if this hurts, but I had to do it. I can't allow this to get out. This is something very private to me, apologized Quinn. Hermione's time-turner was the resource that had allowed him to maintain anonymity. If it wasn't an option, Quinn could potentially have to reveal the existence of the third vault. You were a great help, so I do feel sorry for chaining you down like this. But just as I promised at the office, this doesn't affect anyone other than me. Ms. Potter made sure that no one saw us inside the castle, and our location made sure that no one saw this event. We can forget about this, and it won't matter, muttered Ivy, staring at Quinn, who nodded. Yes, I'm not planning to tell this to anyone, and if you don't, it will remain a secret between us three. The three fell into silence, with none of them wanting to speak. The two girls contemplated the events that had transpired while Quinn observed them. After some time, Quinn noticed that his past self got up. He silently cast a minor mental illusion on the two girls, so they wouldn't see him getting up from the ground and clothe himself with conjured clothes without a wand. When his past self was done, Quinn lifted the mental illusion and alerted the girls. He's done. Ivy and Hermione turned their heads to see the clothed past Quinn limping towards the castle. What's next? asked Hermione. We wait for Luna to enter the office. When she leaves the office, we go to the office, responded Quinn, looking at Ivy as she possessed the Marauder's map. I want to be in the castle the less the better before our past selves leave. Minimum footprint, minimal interference. Scene break. Quinn, Ivy, and Hermione reached the AID office while making sure they weren't seen. Are they gone? asked Hermione to Ivy, who had the Marauder's map open in front of her. Ivy nodded to affirm that their past selves were no longer in the workshop, which prompted Quinn to limp towards the red workshop and open it to check inside, to confirm that the workshop was empty. They are gone, smiled Quinn, turning to the girls. Congratulations? The mission is complete and successful. He limped to the barstool behind his table. Quinn looked towards the girls and spoke. If you hurry, you can still get to the feast with enough time to get a quick bite. Hermione nodded with a sigh. She was definitely feeling both tired and hungry. Thank you once again. Both of you helped me out a lot, and I'm grateful for that, smiled Quinn. Hermione looked at Ivy and was about to gesture to her best friend that they should leave, but then saw that expression on her face, and for some reason, it reminded her of the time when she asked Quinn about the information on the Basilisk after they had been blackmailed by Quinn. Oh, no, what is she about to do, thought Hermione with worry, and then Ivy spoke. Were you the one who saved us inside the Chamber of Secrets? Dash asterisk asterisk dash asterisk asterisk dash asterisk. Quinn West, MC, yeah, even me owes me a debt. Ivy Potter, a better to accomplice, next time on HP, AMJ? What answer will she get? Hermione Granger, accessory to accomplice, thinks today was more stressful than the night before an examination. Chapter 107, The Slip, Hoverboard, Leader Were you the one who saved us in the Chamber of Secrets? Quinn, who was planning to brew a batch of muscle protein nutrient potion and prepare an essence of Didani for his wounds, stilled for a split second, he wasn't expecting this question, the thought that Ivy Potter would ask him this hadn't entered his mind. There were still some times where Quinn didn't associate the decision and actions he had made last year with himself. So when Ivy threw this sudden bomb at him, he genuinely stopped for a moment. But his acting skills came in clutch as there were no sudden actions from Quinn's side as he gained composure almost instantaneously and glanced up at Ivy, following the eye contact with a confused tilt of his head. Pardon me, Ms. Potter, I might have told you about the chamber's location, but I haven't been to the actual Chamber of Secrets. 
I only know that its entrance is somewhere inside Myrtle's lavatory, so believe me when I say that I didn't save you, said Quinn before putting on an expression of curiosity. I actually don't know what happened down in the mysterious chamber of secrets. Can you tell me what happened? He had no intention of ever telling anyone that he had been down in the chamber of secrets. It would raise many questions that Quinn currently didn't want to answer. Even now, there were glass vessels full of basilisk venom and multiple basilisk fangs, locked away in his suitcase, secured for the day when Quinn needed them. Ivy didn't respond and continued to stare at Quinn for a solid few seconds before turning her back to Quinn and walking towards the office door. We're leaving, said Ivy to Hermione. Quinn turned towards Hermione and nodded to her as a goodbye, who returned it before following Ivy to leave. After they left, Quinn groaned as he got up from his barstool. That was sudden. At least I handled it smoothly, sighed Quinn. He limped to the workshop and spoke as the door opened. Now, let's get my body fixed. Scene break. Hermione and Ivy walked away from the AID office. As Quinn had said, there was still some time left in the dinner feast, and both were walking to the Great Hall. Ivy, probed Hermione, glancing at her silent and contemplative best friend. Hermione could guess it was about her question to Quinn but still asked, What are you thinking? The question had been sudden as most of Ivy's abrupt actions when dealing with Quinn, but Hermione had to give it to Ivy because she asked questions that she was curious about or found useful. Ivy didn't look at Hermione as she replied, He was the one who saved us. It was Quinn West who destroyed Riddle's diary, but West said he didn't. He did, and he was lying, spoke Ivy, still not looking at Hermione as she continued. He mentioned something that only someone who has seen the chamber's entrance would know. He did, furrowed Hermione, trying to recall what Quinn said, but nothing popped out to her. Yes, West said that the chamber's entrance was somewhere in Myrtle's lavatory, and that implies that he had never seen the entrance, but then he slipped up. He asked me what happened to us in the chamber. Yes, but how is this him slipping? Asked Hermione, confused. It's the words he used. He didn't use something like inside the chamber but used down in the chamber, said Ivy, finally turning to Hermione. West claims that he had never seen the entrance, so how does he know that the entrance is a tube that goes down to the chamber? Last year's event had led Ivy Potter to think a lot about her interactions with Quinn West. And one thing that she had perceived about Quinn West was his carefulness with words. He chose what to reveal carefully. Usually, he wouldn't make such a slip, but West was clearly hurt and uncomfortable. With those injuries, he unknowingly let that slip. From that, we not only know that he has seen the entrance but also has been inside there. Ivy was convinced that her reason was correct. He was the one who saved us. I am sure of it. And just as she thought last year, this made things complicated. To Ivy Potter, Quinn West was a person who never did anything without a reason or some kind of self-interest. So why would he come down to Chamber of Secrets when he knew that there was a deadly monster like the Basilisk present there? After thinking a lot about it, Ivy couldn't think of a reason Quinn would come down to a dangerous place. There was nothing inside there that would be worth it for Quinn to risk his life. She didn't want to think that Quinn did it selflessly, without any profit, and that made things complicated. Ivy Potter was conflicted. Scene break. Come on, run faster, this pace isn't good enough. Show me some spirit. You want to play as soon as possible, right, said Quinn as he moved behind a slightly panting and sweating Eddie. What, are you, doing? Why are you pushing me today, asked Eddie as he huffed and puffed. Eddie had attended the Ravenclaw Quid Ditch team tryouts for the chaser position. With his daily workouts with Quinn, mixed with his own flying sessions, Eddie passed the tryouts with flying colors and was by far the best chaser applicant from the lot that tried out. It turned out that Eddie was like a game character who completed all the side quests before attempting the main boss because the result from three months of persistent workouts, broom training, and the daily grind had allowed Eddie to breeze through anything that was put in front of him. Eddie was innately tough and didn't seem to scare away from incoming blood jars and didn't dodge too early, which could lead to missing opportunities and was one the biggest problem with new chasers. During the tryouts, Eddie's bludger dodges were so close yet so smooth that the people watching were in awe while sweating at the sheer fearlessness that he displayed. It had prompted Quinn to yell out, mad lad, a ton of times from the stands. But that wasn't even the crazy part about Eddie's tryouts. It was his quaffle throwing skills that had everybody in shock. It turned out that Eddie had a way with the quaffle. He was able to swing the quaffle in every possible direction. Eddie was so damn good that none of the Ravenclaw Keeper applicants couldn't block a single throw from Eddie. And it didn't get any better when the official Ravenclaw Keeper switched in to test him. Eddie, the quaffle bender, successfully scored every single time he threw the ball. In fact, Eddie's performance was so good that he was already better than the three starting chasers. And the only reason he wasn't on the team was that the chaser position required teamwork. Unlike seeker and keeper, chasers and beaters had to work together to keep the quaffle and blood jars moving. Eddie needed to be inducted into the chaser system to function on the team. The team was already planning to make Eddie the primary scorer because of his quaffle throwing skills. Eddie thought that now that he had joined the team, he could relax a little, but it seemed Quinn had different plans. You passed the tryouts, but if you want to be the best chaser, you need to be able to handle the beating from other chasers, who will try to fly into you to knock the quaffle out of your grasp. You need stamina and strength to withstand those blows, so we are upping your training, replied Quinn while still following behind Eddie. Don't think now that you have made the team, you can relax. 
Nope, to attract the ladies, you need to shine, and I am going to make you shine on that field. Edo turned his head back towards Quinn and looked down at Quinn's feet. And what the hell is that? Quinn was following behind Eddie, but he wasn't running like Eddie was. Beneath Quinn's feet was a dark blue skateboard deck-shaped structure with bronze streaks, but without the other components like the truck and the wheels. And Quinn was standing on a wheelless skateboard that hovered off the ground and gilded behind Eddie as he ran. Oh, this? This is a hoverboard, smiled Quinn, leaning forward that made his speed increase and overtook Eddie. He rotated after he got past Eddie and faced him while moving and was now moving along the board's breadth instead of the length. It uses similar charms employed to make brooms, though I have made changes to them. This baby isn't as fast as a broom and can only hover a few feet above the ground, but it has much better control with a silky smooth ride. And if you can hold onto it, you can scale any surface as it can grip onto surfaces while hovering over them. It is pretty easy to control it by shifting your weight to change speeds and brake. Eddie looked at the hoverboard painted in Ravenclaw colors with fascination and wonder. Holy shit, this is amazing. Are you planning to sell these? I want to buy one, asked Eddie as he continued to run. You can have one, smiled Quinn before saying. But, I am not going to sell these. Eddie looked up at Quinn's face and spoke in surprise. But why? This will probably sell more than brooms. I think parents would buy these instead of toy brooms. You have to sell these. Don't you think I thought of that? I already know if I sell these, they will fly off the shelves. But I can't sell them, sighed Quinn before revealing his reasoning. If they go out, people will stop walking. And that is how people get fat. He looked at his feet and declared. This invention of mine is too dangerous for the magical kind. I'm doing this for the sake of the world. Brooms were big and long, so people didn't use them in their daily lives. But Quinn's hoverboards were small and compact. If he sold them, Quinn was sure that obesity would increase among the magical kind. People would stop walking and literally stand on his invention to get places. Also, this looks almost exactly the same as the non-magical skateboard. I'm sure that most of the governments would ban it because if people bought these, one of them could easily get into the hands of a non-magical person. Then change the shape into something else, problem solved, shrugged Eddie, without realizing that Quinn was very slowly increasing his speed, and he was subconsciously trying to keep up with it. I know that, but as I'm not going to sell these, I don't need to. I will change the shape of the one I'll give you, so it won't cause you trouble. The only reason Quinn had brought the hoverboard out was that he was injured and needed to act like nothing was out of place. The first thing he did in the morning was the workout with Eddie. And Quinn never skipped a workout, so to make sure that Eddie didn't notice anything was wrong with him, Quinn decided to sacrifice Eddie's comfort by pushing his workout intensity up a notch while pretending to be a trainer monitoring him. Now, come on. Move those legs. I want to see enough sweat to fill a glass, but remember to stay hydrated. Eddie groaned as he picked up the pace. This sucks. Yeah, show me that spirit. Wine more if it helps, I don't care. You suck. Ah, thank you for the compliment. Scene break. Rivers Locke returned from his low-level clerk job at the ministry to his humble home. He opened his letterbox to check to see if he had some mail waiting for him. Taking out the contents, Rivers shuffled through the various pamphlets, advertisements, subscriptions, and some personal letters. Hmm. Rivers looked at a cheap envelope with nothing written on it, not even the sender's name or who it was addressed to. He opened the envelope and retrieved a folded parchment with words written in untidy scribbles. As Rivers read the parchment and his eyes widened in shock, he immediately folded the parchment, looked around the street, and hurriedly entered his home. Inside his home, Rivers sat down on his dining table and once again read the letter that was left in his letterbox. This is fascinating. I didn't know this existed, muttered Rivers to himself as he reread the contents. The Shrieking Shack has a secret passageway that opens up beneath the Whomping Willow. Rivers Locke, pure blood, was a man in his mid-twenties who worked at the ministry as a low-level clerk. His daily job was collecting the memos from his office area and charm them into airplanes, so they would reach their destination across different parts of the office. A job that caused him to face a lot of abuse when someone didn't get the memo or pretended to not get the charmed memos. It was a menial and repetitive job that had no scope of future progress, and Rivers only did it because he needed to pay the bills. On the personal side of his life, Rivers lived a lonely life, alone without a significant other or even a pet. He didn't have much contact with his family because they liked his older brother better because of his more noteworthy ministry job, while he was stuck as a lowly clerk. That was the Rivers lock, which was presented to the public for everyone to see. A person with low self-esteem, who didn't stand up for himself, let others walk all over him, let others take advantage of him, didn't know how to socially navigate a work environment, someone others wouldn't give a single look of significance. He was just another face in the crowd, forgotten after a single glance. In actuality, Rivers Locke was anything but how he showed himself to the world. A person with low self-esteem? No, Rivers Locke was a person with overflowing confidence in himself and pride that he was better than others. He wasn't a person who didn't stand up for himself. If you crossed Rivers Lock, he would make sure that things would come around to bite them back. He didn't forget easily and held grudges. It would seem that others were taking advantage of Rivers, but it only was because Rivers did nothing about it. If he wanted, they would end up losing instead of taking advantage. He wasn't a socially inept person. Rivers knew exactly what he was doing. He made sure that people wouldn't give him another glance, that they wouldn't think of him as competent. It was all just for show. 
All of it was a facade so that people wouldn't find the real him. The real him that the world wouldn't accept because they couldn't understand him. So Rivers Lock hid away and put on a mask, something that wouldn't gain him much attention, so that he wouldn't have to pretend much. He didn't make friends because that would be more pretending. He didn't get into relations because he wasn't interested. His family didn't seem to take an interest in him, and that was fine with Rivers. But, unfortunately, or fortunately, Rivers found that he couldn't hide his authentic self. He needed an outlet that would let him vent the things that were locked away. To achieve that, he created Novellus Oxyonites. Somewhere he could be himself but at the same time remain in the shadows. Rivers knew what he was doing, and because of that, some Aurors or even some members of Novellus Oxyonites knew who he was. He was able to control an entire terrorist group without ever revealing his identity, not a single aspect that would point out that Rivers Locke was the one who started Novellus Oxyonites. And right now, the anonymous leader of Novellus Oxyonites was sitting on a vital piece of information that allowed him to get inside the castle, which was said to be the most secure place in the country. Rivers rubbed his finger over the bottom of the parchment, and while he considered the information in the letter extremely useful, he didn't like the fact that this letter was delivered to his home. The sender had somehow figured out his identity that he had been able to hide from hundreds of people and the authorities that were out to get him. Peter Pettigrew, muttered Rivers with a flat voice as he stared at the sender's name at the end of the letter, with not a single emotion on his face. Dash asterisk asterisk dash asterisk asterisk dash asterisk. Quinn West, MC, rolling on a hoverboard with style. Ivy Potter, smarter of the Potter twins, conflicted with the knowledge. Eddie Carmichael, past the tryouts, I hate moving. Rivers Locke, leader of Novellus Oxyonites, anonymous. Alan L., editor, so Quinn doesn't want people to get fat, huh? He's Sue Noble. Chapter 108, getting better by learning Quinn stood in front of the full-size mirror in his, Eddie's, and Marcus's dorm room while twisting and turning his body. He was looking to the mirror to see the state of his body. All right, no pain, no scarring, the coloration is consistent, everything seems to be back to normal, noted Quinn as he jumped, flexed, and moved his body to check if his body was functioning normally. The Leviathan's underpass incident had been three days ago, and it had taken Quinn this time to heal himself while pretending that nothing was wrong with him. With copious use of glamours and illusions, Quinn was able to hide the fact that he was walking around with a punctured lung and a ripped intestine amid healing. After the Time Turner events, Quinn had pulled an all-nighter to fix enough stuff that would allow him to function without arousing suspicion. For three days, Quinn had spent almost all his time in the Room of Requirements, fully concentrating on healing. Quinn didn't have experience with healing humans. Sure he could heal minor wounds, but this level of injuries wasn't something he had tackled. So every step he took was planned with caution and executed with excess care, even if it meant that Quinn spent almost every waking second of his day casting healing magic. But that hard work and persistence were rewarded with a complete recovery. If someone were to look at Quinn, they wouldn't realize that he was stabbed, cut, and fractured just three days ago. Damn, I look good, smirked Quinn narcissistically, flexing poses in front of the mirror. At that moment, Marcus walked out of the attached bathroom after having taken a bath to see Quinn making poses in front of the mirror while dressed only in his underwear. Don't be creepy, and drop that smirk, it's weird, said Marcus as he passed by Quinn towards his wardrobe. Dress up quickly. I'm hungry, we need to go to breakfast. Yeah, said Quinn, clearing his throat as he stopped posing and walked towards his bed where he had laid down his clothes. Then Marcus saw Eddie, lying face side down on his bed, not really moving. What happened to him? Hmm? Oh, it's nothing. I just put him through an anaerobic course. He is gassed out, replied Quinn, as he buttoned up his shirt. Marcus lifted his leg and gently kicked Eddie on his bum. Eddie groaned. Come on, get in the shower. We need to get going, spoke Marcus as he too started to get ready for the day. Eddie groaned for a solid 10 seconds before pushing himself off the bed. He walked towards the bathroom. As he passed by Quinn, Eddie tried to kick him, but Quinn arched his back forward, making him miss. Quinn chuckled as Eddie clicked his tongue and walked into the bathroom. After getting dressed, Quinn and Marcus went down to the common room to wait for Eddie as he got ready. Good morning, Luna, greeted Quinn and sat beside his favorite Ravenclaw, excluding himself, of course. Luna lifted her head from this week's copy of Quibbler to face Quinn. Good morning. She then stared at Quinn for a good few seconds before asking. It seems you are feeling all right. Quinn sat down beside Luna and raised a brow in inquiry. What do you mean? I was always all right, Luna. Inside he was feeling a little worried. You weren't feeling well for the past three days, but today you seem fine, answered Luna. Why do you say that? Luna took out a package from her book bag and turned to Quinn. When talking to the clients in the office, you were less. Quinn-like, it wasn't that different, but I noticed it. Second, you were smiling and speaking less than usual, so I assumed you weren't feeling well. She placed the package onto Quinn's lap and said, This is your copy of the special issue of the Quibbler. It goes out next week, but Daddy sent two in advance, one for me and this one for you. Quinn stared at Luna in amazement as the blonde went back to reading the special issue of Quibbler while holding it sideways because of the sideways layout of one of the articles inside. He had thought that he had successfully pulled acting normal, but it seemed like someone observant like Luna, who spent a lot of time with him, noticed that something was wrong. I still have a long way to go, it seems, smiled Quinn, but then another thought entered his mind, and it made him think, maybe it's a good thing. 
Quinn took out a chocolate from his pocket and held his hand in front of Luna. This is for you, Luna. But don't eat it now, okay? Luna glanced at the chocolate, picked it up from Quinn's hand, pocketed the small chocolate before going back to reading. Marcus came back from checking the in-house library to see if it was updated. There are two new books, one on arithmancy and the second on astronomy. Why are you smiling? Asked Marcus when he noticed a broad smile on Quinn's face. It's nothing, replied Quinn as he put the special issue of the quibbler into his book bag. Scene break. Quinn stretched inside the aquatic vault stone cave with a severe expression on his face. He raised his eyes towards the triangular entrance and walked towards it to start the trials. As Quinn walked towards the entrance, he smoothly raised his hand to touch the orb of water, which provided him with the safety teleportation insignia. The water orb was absorbed into his body, and the blue insignia appeared on his body. Let's do a speed run. As Quinn stepped into the triangular entrance, he began transfiguring himself. The insides and outside of his body wriggled, and the underwater respiratory system began to form. By the time he was teleported, Quinn had already taken the first gulp of water, which activated the system. Quinn opened his eyes. He felt the water around him disappear and saw the raging vortex beneath him. Without using any magic to slow himself down, Quinn assumed a diving posture and plunged into Poseidon's wrath with zero hesitation. Inside the violent water, Quinn raised his hands wide and exerted water magic. Immediately the rampaging water started to curve around him, leaving behind a much gentler flow for him to stand in. His eyes sharpened as he looked towards the center of the vortex, and even though he couldn't see the center because of the moving water, Quinn knew it was there, and he had to get there. Out was the gradual path switch approach which Quinn had used when he had been helpless against the roaring currents. But now, Quinn looked at the gentle stream of water surrounding him. Now, the angry maelstrom bent under his will, under his magic, under the control he was able to exert on anything water. Quinn contorted his body slightly, and with that movement, the magic started to build inside him. It rushed, ready to perform supernatural feats, and with a command from Quinn, it released into the world. He shot forward, and the arctic blue magic rushed ahead and around him, forcing the water to come down for Quinn to cruise through the path as if he owned it. Poseidon's wrath, which required Quinn to go in circles around the vortex as he got close to the center, was conquered as Quinn paved a straight route directly to the center. When he came out to the center with speed, Quinn dropped straight down, without bothering to slow himself down, and entered Tohem's delight without an intermission. Quinn enjoyed the calm embrace of the chasm of darkness, but he instantly broke the calm by creating spherical waves of water to launch a search operation to the next trial. Tihum's delight shook as wave after wave of deep water vibrations were sent out from Quinn, who stood straight in the water, already used to the unusual calmness of Tihum's delight. He could shake the effects if he concentrated. Within a few seconds, Quinn got back the vibrations, and using haptics and magical senses, he interpreted them to find the location of the next triangular entrance. Up, thought Quinn as the entrance was above him. A burst of arctic blue magic pushed Quinn up at a jet speed. He left behind shock waves of water in trail. Quinn didn't slow down and directly entered the entrance, which teleported him out of Tihum's delight. The light from the crystal lattice assaulted Quinn's eyes, causing him to squint a little, but the moment his eyes adjusted, Quinn focused on his next target. The well of hadal encumbrance that aimed to crush anyone who dared to venture inside, and it waited for Quinn to get inside and face the challenge. Quinn stepped into the well, and despite it being a deep hole, Quinn walked to the center as if he was walking from the shallow end of the pool to the deeper side. Ripples shook the water inside hadal encumbrance as Quinn sank down into the well. Instead of just creating a small area of normalized pressure, Quinn normalized the entire well and all the water inside. The entirety of the pressure that threatened to crush Quinn disappeared as his magic applied dynamic water forced to push up against the downward pressure. His magic overrode the oppressive nature of the trial and forced it to convert into something that Quinn desired. Quinn stared down towards the entrance at the bottom of the well. The words etched above the entrance stared back at him, which made him recall the jets of razor-sharp water that pierced holes in his body. His eyes closed them as he slipped into the entrance and was taken away to the place that was named the Leviathan's Underpass. The same tunnel greeted Quinn with its white marbled floor and the circular wall of water that encased Quinn inside in a tubular form. His feet touched the white marble, which had a grainy surface, probably designed to prevent slippage since there was water there. I'm back again, thought Quinn, as he stared straight ahead at the entrance that was 50 meters ahead of him. Quinn closed his eyes, and water started to ripple around him. He felt some rage bubble inside of him. Quinn had been channeling anger the entire way. His usual methods of passing the trials were injected with the emotion of anger, and that added an aspect of brute forcing through his actions today. Quinn wanted to get here as quickly as possible without wasting time in the trials he had already passed. You have caused me a lot of trouble in the last few days, thought Quinn, staring at the Leviathan's underpass. It was as if he was talking to the trial. I had to mess with time without knowing how it actually works. It could have gone wrong, and I could have lost my life. Just remembering the thought of asking someone else even if that someone else was himself made his blood boil. That, in consequence, made the rippling more and more pronounced. You made me use a debt that I wasn't planning to cash in. I had to reveal a part of my life that I didn't want to share. Ivy Potter and Hermione Granger's debt had been gained while under the influence of the sin curse. And it had been obtained through blackmail, which wasn't Quinn's preferred means of gaining favors. 
He liked people to think that they were simply helping Quinn back when he helped them out. Quinn preferred when the other party thought they were doing things with their own free will and not because he held something to their heads. Calling that debt not only meant that he had been backed into a corner but it also revealed something that he had been keeping under the wraps. Last year, he had to reveal the second vault to his family, and while he didn't regret it, Quinn didn't want more people to know about the cursed vaults. But then, this happened, Ivy and Hermione ended up seeing him in his most prone state, and even though they never found about the vaults, it was too close for comfort. It pissed him off. Let's get this started. Quinn stepped forward, and the spherical waves rippled out from him, initiating his sonar vision. The waves went out, bounced off the water walls, and came back to him to whisper about the things around him. Ten steps in, Quinn felt four chaotic swirls twisted into existence in the surrounding water, two behind him, one above him, and the last right in front of him. Quinn did a lazy wave, and the water swirls flashed in arctic blue before fizzling into oblivion. More. From then on out, with each step Quinn took, more and more swirls started to appear at an increasingly fast rate. You get a boop, you get a boop, you get a boop, everyone gets a boop, thought Quinn. He had his hands behind his back as he walked forward. Quinn destroyed the water swirls that were supposed to shoot pressurized jets of water before they could get them out. From outside of the water tunnel it looked like Quinn was walking on the white marble while several arctic blue lights flashed all around him. After passing the quarter mark, Quinn cancelled out 30 water swirls every few seconds. His occlumency was working overtime to decipher the information from the sonar, and his magic casting skill was being pushed to the limit by targeting 30 randomly emerging targets. Hmm. Halfway through the second quarter, Quinn had to handle 40 targets every couple of seconds. It was getting difficult to consistently destroy all targets. Need to change tactics, decided Quinn, he was getting into the territory in which one miss would hit Quinn with a pressurized jet of water that would rip any part of his body. So right after he stopped a wave of swirls to annihilate him, Quinn raised his arm up, and a dome of transparent arctic blue briefly flashed around him. Let's see how the defense works. Quinn stopped walking, and just when the arctic blue light disappeared, another 40 swirls appeared, and for the first time today, 40 spears of pressurized jets of water shot out. All 40 water spears collided against Quinn's dome, and every contact point glowed in arctic blue while ripples went out on impact. All right, pretty stable integrity. Nothing seems to be getting past, noted Quinn and once again started walking. What started at 4 swirls had now become 50 swirls and thus 50 simultaneous hits against his dome of protection. 50 hits every couple of seconds were so abundant that Quinn's dome of protection was fully glowing in arctic blue. The color wouldn't even get to fade before another volley would light up the dome. Quinn finally crossed 25 meters which marked the halfway point of the 50 meter path. Then, the barrage of pressured water stopped. What? He immediately became cautious and pushed magic into the dome of protection, making it glow a fluorescent arctic blue all around. The sudden stop of attacks didn't fit well, and Quinn's hunch proved to be correct when ten bigger, more contorted swirls of magic appeared around him. These new swirls looked more menacing, and looking at them closely, Quinn could see that water was being funneled and sucked into the swirls, making them whiter and more contorted. Then the attack came. Ten beams of pressurized water came out of ten swirls. Oh, voice Quinn as he felt the push of the beams against his protection. Unlike the previous swirl attacks, which shot spears of water before disappearing for new ones to appear, these were continuous sharp emissions of water endlessly assaulting Quinn's dome of protections. The power of impact was much higher than the previous type. But, it's not enough. Quinn stood up straight and once again began confidently walking ahead. For each step he took, five more water beams would be added to the tally, and within eight steps, Quinn was again back to 50 attacks, but this time, he was facing a continuous assault. This is still not enough, thought Quinn. Just as Quinn had predicted, with every passing trial, things got easier for him. Not because of the trials getting easier. No. The trials were getting tough in their own way. It was because of Quinn's decision to apply water magic to solve the trials. The second he entered, Quinn employed the sonar vision he developed for T-Hum's delight. He was able to tell when and where the attacks were coming and thus had an easier time defending against them. Before deploying the shield to defend, Quinn had been on the offense, fizzling out the swirls before they could shoot out their attacks. He had learned to manipulate water from Poseidon's wrath. As he had to learn the art of controlling turbulent water, the spears of pressurized water became simply another form of that. If Poseidon's wrath was an application where moving water was used to sweep everything in its path then, the swirls in Leviathan's underpass were applications where moving water was being used to cut through anything placed in front of them. The dome of protection which Quinn used was also water magic. The swirls were a physical offense where water was being shot at high pressure to form concentrated beams of destruction. Unlike ice, where the molecules were densely packed, water had an element of flexibility. Quinn's water magic dome, when assaulted, transferred the energy from the incoming water beam. It employed the flexibility of water to carry that incoming energy, divert it away across the dome's surface, and finally released it into the surroundings. With every trial, Quinn had gotten better at using water magic. This year he had studied a lot of water magic, and because he had to go through different water terrains every time he entered the aquatic vault, Quinn had been able to gain tons of experience with water magic. And all that experience was coming into play right now, which allowed him to stroll through Leviathan's underpass. 
Quinn couldn't see anything because the 50 water beams obstructed his view, but under his dome, Quinn felt safe, so he continued to walk. Quinn noticed when he walked into the fourth quarter as the 50 water beams suddenly gained a ton of strength. Oh, my, if these hit me, my body won't be solid anymore, thought Quinn, but continued to walk what would it be? Instant gory mush. The first few shots at the start of the path, which were much weaker than the current attacks, had disabled Quinn. If he had stayed there for a few seconds more, he would have been dead. It made Quinn think about how much magic could achieve. Then suddenly, all attacks stopped, and Quinn found himself in front of the entrance at the end of the tunnel. So, it's done, huh, thought Quinn. He looked back to see the white marbled floor and the opposite end he had started at. If Quinn was honest, he expected more out of the trial that had almost killed him. I guess the element of surprise was the thing that doomed me. After thinking that, Quinn turned back to the triangular unnamed entrance. He took a big gulp of water and went through it. He disappeared from Leviathan's underpass. Dash asterisk asterisk dash asterisk asterisk dash asterisk. Quinn West, MC, I am good looking. Luna Lovegood, observant, knows her boss. Eddie Carmichael, chaser, you ugh. Fiction only reader, author. Next chapter is the end and the reward. Chapter 109, Water Visions, Magic of Water, Reactions. Quinn opened his eyes and, once again, he was in the water. That didn't surprise him. It was the last thing that would surprise him. He looked to his side and saw that he was lying on a white marbled floor. What's the deal here? Asked Quinn to himself and tried to get up, but then things changed. The second Quinn tried to get up, the entirety of water around him glowed arctic blue, and Quinn's eyes widened because of an emotion he couldn't describe. All thoughts of getting up from the floor disappeared, and Quinn laid back, not moving a single muscle in his body. What is this? A warm and comfortable feeling enveloped Quinn, and it was like nothing he had ever experienced. Quinn felt like he had been living in unrelenting conditions, struggling with the harsh realities of the world, and now he was at the end of the road, finally able to rest in peace. His taut muscles all over his body relaxed as the magic in the water made him relax. Without Quinn knowing, the injuries he had healed to completion somehow healed some more and then went even further. Quinn didn't realize it, but his body was going through a process of healing so thorough and miraculous that it wasn't something he had ever experienced. Things that Quinn's own body didn't realize needed healing were healing. Every single part of the body was going through healing. Every system in the 11 organ systems, including the integumentary, skeletal, muscular, lymphatic, respiratory, digestive, nervous, endocrine, cardiovascular, urinary, and reproductive systems was covered. Not a single cell in Quinn's body was left behind. Every cell in his body was being filled with a never-seen-before vitality. While all this happened, Quinn was busy feeling his magic. For someone like him, who used all his magic every day, it was needed to know how much magic he had to plan for consumption. Quinn had an excellent awareness of how much magic was there in his body. Right now, Quinn was feeling something mysterious and enchanting. My magic is being regenerated, but at this speed. Every magical human had a magical core that held all their magic, and one could increase the capacity of said cores by using more magic. Quinn did that every day by using all his magic and was absolutely confident in declaring that he had the best magic growth in the entire world. When someone used magic, they also regenerated it back, and everybody had their own magic regeneration speed. It depended on a few factors. The size of the magical core, as the capacity increased, so did the recovery speed. A person's health, if a person was facing injury, was sick because an injury, or facing some kind of affliction, their rate of recovery would be on a down low. A person's lifestyle, if one lived a healthy lifestyle, the recovery speed would be higher than a person with an unhealthy lifestyle. Rest, the recovery speed increased when a person was resting. Activities like relaxing or sleeping would exponentially increase the rate of recovery. And currently, Quinn was feeling his magic recover at a rate that he hadn't ever experienced before. It was even faster than when Quinn was asleep at his best health. At this rate, I could recover from 0 to 100 within 3 hours, no, maybe even faster. Quinn closed his eyes and immersed in the fabulous feeling. Quinn felt that he could stay in here for his entire life and wouldn't regret a single second of it. He was feeling so absolutely fantastic that it was borderline euphoric. Then Quinn felt a very gentle nudge of mental magic against his occlumency shields. It wasn't trying to break into his mind, its intention was different. The mental magic was asking for permission to enter. Quinn thought for a moment before deciding to send a legilimency probe towards mental magic poking against his shields. He wanted to see if he could find something out before allowing it entry, and the response Quinn got was that it was some kind of memory. A memory, how surprising, thought Quinn, feeling very intrigued. He had no idea who had constructed the ivy vault or the sin vault because of the lack of any kind of trace indicating their creator's identity, so to see a memory made Quinn think he would be able to find who created this vault. Quinn rescinded the legilimency probe and opened his occlumency shield to let the mental magic carrying a memory come in. Inside Quinn's mindscape, a mental representation of him looked up to see a glowing water orb followed by various shades of blue manifest, from the lightest of baby blues to the darkest of the midnight blues. And with that, the memory was revealed with a bright flash of blue. Outside, Quinn's eyes snapped wide open, and his eyes both his irises and the sclera turned a solid glowing arctic blue. His chest raised up as the water surrounding him lifted Quinn up from the white floor, and as he lifted up, his body glowed in different shades of blue. 
The incoming memory engulfed his entire being. The memory started with a vision of extremely hot bubbling water. To match that, the water surrounding Quinn heated up, not to the point in the vision, but enough for Quinn to feel the heat. There was nothing at first, but slowly things started to change as microscopically small organisms emerged and developed in the extremely scorching water. Then the vision seemed to fast forward at an incredible speed as the water started to cool down, and with time which seemed to be eons, different mysterious creatures roamed those waters. The vision switched, and now Quinn saw a gigantic huge tsunami wave coming right towards him, and within seconds, it crashed against him. The water outside turned turbulent to match the memory and rode all over him. Rain and storm accompanied the tsunami waves, creating a tandem whose sole aim was to cause destruction. The enormity of the tsunami waves was more terrifying than whatever Quinn had ever seen, and it caused his heart to race in fear. Against the titanic waves, Quinn felt they could erase him like an insignificant bug. The vision shifted, and Quinn found himself among a myriad of fishes swimming underwater. There were all kinds of aquatic creatures that swarmed around and passed him, he saw both magical and non-magical creatures gliding around. He looked down to see beautiful coral reefs below him. He felt a shadow cast upon him and the reefs, and when he looked over, he saw a large blue whale swimming over him. But then what Quinn recognized as a leviathan appeared above the whale, and the gigantic serpentine dragon dwarfed the whale and cast an even deeper shadow over both him and the blue whale. The image dissolved, and Quinn was suddenly in the air overseeing a forest full of lush and vibrant trees. Then, Quinn heard a rush of water, he turned and saw a horrifying flood trampling towards the woods. Within seconds, the angry flood crashed against the lush tree forest, and he could hear the shaking crunch of trees breaking through the roaring waves of water. Suddenly, the vision made Quinn descend into the forest, and there he saw the sickening sight of animals that lived within the forest struggling against the flood. Quinn heard the screams and witnessed the death of a beautiful ecosphere rich with flora and fauna, something that would take the area years to recover from. The scene once again disappeared like sand in the air to show a drastic change in the scenery. Quinn stood at the bank of a river stream, and on the opposite side of the stream was a herd of deer drinking water, and it was not just the deers but all kinds of animals near it that relied on the river. He looked into the clear water and watched fishes swimming by. Quinn followed a fish with his eyes, and suddenly a heron bird, who was standing by the bank, swooped in with its beak, picked a fish out of the river, and flew away. The vision again went through a change, and now he stood near a pond of steaming water. Quinn stood still for ten seconds staring at the steaming water before, without warning, the water started to bubble, followed by an eruption as a water geyser emerged from the pond. The water from the geyser came down, steamy mist filled with the area, obstructing Quinn's vision. In the foggy mist, the atmosphere changed from humid wetness to a chilly cold. And when it cleared, Quinn stood on an ice gap over the vast, cold, unforgiving ocean. He was facing a spanning glacier that stretched across the horizon. Unlike the violent and noisy geyser, the glacier and ice caps were silent, reserved, and deadly. The ice cap beneath Quinn's feet abruptly cracked and, just as abruptly he had appeared, he sank down into the bone-chilling water. Quinn splashed around in the water, he tried to move and was unexpectedly successful. He raised his body and Quinn found himself coming up a stream of running water. At the end of the stream, Quinn heard a roaring noise, and when he reached the end of the stream, his eyes popped out because he was flung down from an edge of what seemed to be a gigantic waterfall. Quinn fell into the blasting water at the base of the waterfall, and suddenly there was no wild water. It became calm, and the model of serenity surrounded him. He felt his back touch and settle against a surface, and when Quinn opened his eyes, he was back in the aquatic vault, his back against the water marble, while staring at the light streaming through the water. Quinn didn't say anything and silently lay against the white marble floor. His mind was going through the scenes he had seen in the memory and contemplated what he had seen. His initial hope of seeing the creator of the aquatic vault had been dashed, and what he was shown had left a deep impression on his life. Quinn closed his eyes and let the feelings he was experiencing sink in. It was an indefinite time after which Quinn opened up his eyes, and they showed tranquility, unagitation, and peace. The teleportation insignia on Quinn's arm flashed with a blue light and whisked him away from the place, leaving behind a ripple. Scene break. The kraken watched one of its tentacles as it swished back and forth and was about to add another tentacle to create a double swish when its yellow eye caught the special human coming out of the dangerous place. Kraken's eyes sparkled when it saw the special human, because it had decided today that it was going to push the tiny human a whole seven times before letting him go. But then the kraken noticed something odd with the special human. Through its mighty eyes, the kraken could see a noble blue aura around the special human, something that hadn't been around the tiny human before. It had seen the same aura once before. It was a time before the kraken had come to rest in this place and lived in the oceans. During those times, no creature of water dared to go against its mighty self, all of them bowed their heads to it and feared him. But one day, a traveler came to its territory, simply passing by, as if he was looking for a place to rest. The traveler had the same appearance as the fish people, merpeople, that lived along with him now, but unlike the weak fish people, the traveler was strong. The traveler had the same blue aura around him, and the water seemed to talk to him. The water seemed to enjoy moving along the traveler's will, enjoyed his touch, and seemed more lively when the traveler was around. The kraken didn't know what the blue aura meant, but it knew that the blue aura was special, and now it was seeing it for the second time on the special human. In kraken's mind, the special human just became more special, more special than almost any human it had ever seen. 
Scene break. Quinn stood on the lake bed in the center of the lake with his eyes closed. Water was one of the mysterious gifts of nature that supported and held life on Earth. Many indigenous communities had known the value of water for a long time. On the surface, water could be seen as food, a means of transport, an element for cleansing, purification, and initiation in cultural ceremonies. But deep down, water was something much more important, and while everybody knew it, Quinn became aware of it on a deeper level. Yet, it's the source, thought Quinn back to the sentence in the riddle. Fryer was right, it was the source. Water is the cradle of life. If the sacred gift of the earth was life, water was the custodian of life. Water was sacred because it held life on earth. A seed in the soil does not germinate until it receives water. No life on earth could live without water. But at the same time, there was a duality to water. It can give life, but it can also destroy it at the same time. While rain brought life to the earth, storms uprooted the same life that it nurtured. If water was life, then the absence of it was death. Without water, drought, and famine would overrun the earth. Tornadoes, hurricanes, tsunamis, tidal waves could wipe out all life in its path with no regard. They were the destructive phenomenon of nature that harnessed the power of the thing that covered 71% of all earth. No matter how much any species on earth tried to avoid it, they wouldn't be able to come out of it unscathed. Even humans, who built structures that tried to stand up to these agents of destruction, couldn't come out of it without suffering massive losses. In many mythologies across the world, floods were seen as divine retribution from higher powers sent to destroy the corrupt civilizations so that rebirth could start from those waters. Water was the driving force of all nature, good or bad. Quinn had been looking at water from the perspective of magic. He thought about how it could be manipulated, how he could use it for his advantage. To Quinn, it was just something he could use magic on. The visions he had seen inside the vault made Quinn realize how small his view of water was. The visions had caused him to gain enlightenment of sorts. And from the bottom of his heart, Quinn wanted to showcase that enlightenment. Quinn deeply desired to show what he had experienced. For him, magic was the best way in which he could display his understanding, and the Great Lake was the best canvas, on which the brush of magic would showcase its charm. He knew that what he was about to do would garner a lot of attention, and if he was found out, it would be a giant pain in the future. But Quinn couldn't hold it back. Quinn could feel his magic demanded that he do it now, his ego desired it more than anything in the world, every cell inside Quinn's body urged him to do it. His mind, body, and soul wished for it. So Quinn let his restraints go. For this one time, Quinn let desire trump logic and let his ego overtake his identity. Quinn's eyes opened, and instead of the stone gray, two orbs of glowing purple greeted the world. Scene break. Ivy, Harry, and Lily Potter walked together through a corridor to Lily's private corridor in Hogwarts. How are your studies going? Asked Lily as they walked. Harry, looking at the chocolate card of Flavius Belby and trying to remember why it seemed familiar, shrugged in response. Except potions with Snape, everything is fine. Lily furrowed her brows before sighing, I have tried to talk to him, but he doesn't seem to want to listen. And Harry, it's Professor Snape. Harry rolled his eyes in response and shook the card in his hand, hoping that would jog his memory, but he drew a blank. What about you, Ivy, dear, smiled Lily, looking at her daughter. While her son took after his father, her daughter took after her. Ivy had better grades than Harry, and Lily liked to think it was because of her. Everything is fine. Hermione and I are already on revision, answered Ivy smoothly. The redhead Potter twin took her studies seriously. Unlike Hermione, who seemed to have made books of her daily sustenance, she liked to learn by doing. She enjoyed the practical experience rather than the extensive reading that her best friend enjoyed. That didn't mean that she didn't read, Ivy still read much more than the average person, she just enjoyed casting magic more. Bookworms, muttered Harry at the mention of revision. Whatever, four eyes, retorted Ivy at the quip. Lily smiled at her two children's antics before asking, on the subject of revision, did any of you two buy Quinn West's notes this year? If you haven't, I'll give you the money to buy them, they are quite a good buy. The Potter twins stilled for a second and didn't reply, both thought about their interaction with Quinn. Harry still hadn't talked about Peter Pettigrew with anyone other than Ivy. The twins had decided to research Peter on their own and to simply wait for the day their parents would talk to them about Peter on their own. Ivy, on the other hand, thought about the time travel events. It didn't help when the events had taken place just a few days ago. She still couldn't wrap her head around what happened that day. Not to mention when she found that Quinn was the one to save her and Harry from the Chamber of Secrets. As Lily didn't hear a response from her twins she assumed that the two hadn't bought the guides. If you two want to buy it, I highly recommend them. Come to me for the money if you decide to buy them. Yes, replied the Potter twins at the same time. Ivy sighed and decided to look out at the scenery to distract her from her thoughts, but lo and behold, she saw the Great Lake in full view. Lovely, sighed Ivy, but then she stopped in her tracks when she saw ripples on the surface of the lake. Lily and Harry also slowed when they saw Ivy suddenly stop. What is it, Ivy, asked Lily and walked towards her daughter. There are ripples in the lake, replied Ivy and pointed at the Great Lake in the distance. The mother and son followed Ivy's directions and saw rapid ripples on the surface of the lake. But the situation changed very quickly when they saw some very drastic changes in the lake. Their eyes widened to the limit when they saw a drain right in the middle of the lake. It started with a narrow point, but then, the water sank down in a line, and in a few seconds, the water started to split in the middle. 
The lake is splitting, spoke Harry, trying to put the scene in front of him in words. The girls didn't say anything and just stared at the bizarre scene in front of them, and within a minute, the entire lake was split into two parts, and they could see the lakebed path in the middle of the lake. Lily finally snapped out of it and realized that she had to do something. I, I have to alert the other professors. She turned to her children and ordered, you two go to your common room. Immediately after saying that, she ran off to alert the other faculty. Ivy and Harry, of course, didn't listen to their mother, they stepped closer to the edge of the corridor and stared at the lake. Ivy thought about who was causing this, and only one person came to her mind. The person who had come out of the Great Lake, heavily injured. But just like her previous many suspicions and conjectures about the person, she had no proof that he was the one causing this. Scene break. Friar, the Hufflepuff ghost, was gliding his merry way through the walls of Hogwarts. It was just another day of his ghostly life, but that changed when he got out a wall, and right in front of him was the view of the Great Lake. In the name of Helga herself? What? exclaimed Friar as his belly jiggled in shock. He stared at the spit that was right in the middle of the Great Lake. The single body of water was turned into two with a clear and visible divide in the middle as the water tried to come back together but couldn't because something was stopping it. And just when he thought that his ghostly self couldn't be more shocked today, another change happened in the Great Lake, and two whirlpools appeared in the lake, one on each side. Anyone who could see this would assume that it was because of magic, and Friar was no different. So his next thought was that whose work was this? Then the answer struck, and he uttered the name. Quinn. Is this because of the cursed vault down below? At first, he thought it couldn't be Quinn, this feat of magic was too much for a child of Quinn's age, but when he thought about it more, the more the possibility of it being Quinn got stronger. If it's indeed Quinn, then how is that child capable of splitting the lake? How strong is that child? Such thoughts revolved in the mind of the ghostly being. Scene break. Albus Dumbledore stared out of his window in his office, which was located on the headmaster's tower, and at a height only second to the astronomy tower. The headmaster with a long beard, who was over a hundred years old, stared at the Great Lake with his aged eyes full of wisdom. He had just returned from the ministry after handling some business, and when he was passing by his window with a bowl full of sour candy in his hand, he saw the Great Lake divided into two with a whirlpool on each side. And now, as Dumbledore continued to stare at the strange and out-of-the-place phenomenon, he saw two massive masses of water come out of the center of whirlpools, floating up into the air. Oh my, that's some impressive magic, chuckled Dumbledore in an impressed tone, but his eyes weren't portraying the same emotions. The blue eyes shined in a calculative and analytical light as Dumbledore stared at the Great Lake. The holder of the Elder Wand thought about who was doing this and where did they come from. Dumbledore first eliminated the possibility of the person being a student because the reserves and knowledge of water magic required was something he believed a student couldn't achieve. He knew of a few smart students in the castle, but even the smartest of them couldn't possibly achieve this. Dumbledore was so sure of it because the brightest student he had seen Hogwarts produce was the one named Tom Riddle, and even he couldn't do this while he was in his school years. So the remaining options were a professor, a resident of the Great Lake, or an unknown outsider. He eliminated the Great Lake resident because only merpeople in there could manipulate water, and he was sure that none of them was this capable. The remaining options were professors or an outsider, and he was leaning towards intruders because none of his professors were this powerful. It's an outsider, then. I have to make sure the students are safe, said Dumbledore, and the bowl in his hand levitated to the nearby table as he walked out of the office with the death stick in his hand. But it turned out that by the time he got to the Great Lake, the waters had gone back to normal. Even after investigating, he didn't find anything but rich and heavy traces of advanced water magic. He talked to the merpeople inside, and the only unusual thing they told him was that the recent upheavals in the lake had been caused by the giant squid. Dash asterisk asterisk dash asterisk asterisk dash asterisk. Quinn West, MC, Moses, Ivy Potter, girl twin. This is him, isn't it? Harry Potter, boy twin, rapidly blinking in confusion. Lily Potter, professor, fan slash promoter of the AID guides. Friar, Hufflepuff ghost, his belly shakes like a bowl full of jelly. Albus Dumbledore, headmaster, going through a sour candy phase. Chapter 110, Music, Scheme, and Promise. If you want to read ahead, you can check out my Patreon at https slash slash www.patreon.com slash fictiononlyreader. The link is also in the synopsis. The chapter is edited by my editor, Alan underscore Lou slash Alan L. Dash asterisk asterisk dash asterisk asterisk dash asterisk. It was a time of the year that Quinn really enjoyed. Just as his second year when he completed the icy vault, this year, he had completed the aquatic vault, and now he was feeling as cool as a cucumber. There was spring in his steps and dance in his moves. At random times, he would break into a dance and enjoy the vibe he was feeling. The same thing happened when he finished the icy vault. While he very much enjoyed going through the vaults, there was always a sense of urgency in the back of Quinn's head in which he needed to complete one vault a year. So when he wrapped up the aquatic vault, Quinn felt he was done for the year. If he had to draw a very loose parallel, then the cursed vaults to him were what examinations were to students. When they ended, students rejoiced like they were part of a nation that just got independence from an oppressive power. The only difference was that Quinn enjoyed the time he spent down in the vaults, unlike many students who didn't enjoy exams. And for the first time in months, 
Quinn was free, so he took out his violin, and with it, decided to cast some magic to lighten up that extra high tension exam mood that plagued the Ravenclaw house every year. He rested the violin on his shoulder and his fingers on the strings, the other hand grasped the bow. He then gently descended on the strings to play a vibrant tune with sweet calm tones. At first, the sound was only audible inside Quinn's dorm room and partially audible to the nearby rooms, but as the minutes progressed, the fiddle of the violin traveled all across the boys' dorm. Some of the boys didn't appreciate the sudden disturbance when they studied for the exams, which were close, but no one got up from their seats and asked the player to stop, something in the sound made them keep still and listen. In his room, Quinn smiled with his eyes closed. Seeing that no one was here to stop him from playing meant that the magic was working and, thus, he could increase the radius. Streams of magic traveled down from Quinn's arms to the violin and bow, and the sound started to flow with an extra something behind it. The slow tempo mixed with magic carried all the way to the common room and the girls' dormitory on the other side, and filled the entire Ravenclaw dorms with Quinn's music. Anyone who heard the music felt the tension drain from their bones, and calm seep into their minds and bodies. The slow sound made them forget about the stress of the incoming exams. That moment made them stop running, stop, and kick back to get a relaxing pit stop. Quinn, who had his eyes closed while playing the violin, mixed two types of magic together to create his desired effect. He blended mind magic together with the enchanting sorcery of sound and music to create magical melodies. Using the wings provided by the harmonies, Quinn spread the influence of the mind arts to sway the mood of those who listened. This idea came from two sources, the first was, of course, the dreaded Sin Vault, which had messed with his mind and emotion on a deep level, the second inspiration was from his mind magic teacher, Alan D. Baddeley, who had once used mind magic to forcefully calm him down. Like Alan, Quinn subtly altered the listener's present mood. It wasn't as intrusive as the Sin Vault, but did reside on the same mental magic line. The use of sound magic was to increase the range and effectiveness of magic. Quinn, who had studied illusion magic, knew how to influence the human senses and recognized its efficacy while manipulating a target. People would subconsciously concentrate on sounds, and this was especially true for magic. So when Quinn laced the music with mental magic, the listeners got quickly influenced because their minds were concentrating on the music. Of course, there were downsides to this usage it wasn't particularly effective when people were at guard against it, or if they had earplugs on and couldn't listen to the music, or were outright deaf. All right, let's hype up this performance, thought Quinn, and the tune went through a drastic change. The rhythm started to build up, and the sound turned from gentle and calming to upbeat and exciting. Everyone in Ravenclaw started to tap their feet and bob their head to the rhythm of the cheerful tune. Slowly they were being guided from the calmness of the earlier piece to the bop of the current one. The person who felt the most was Quinn himself, who channeled his current spirit into the animated funk. His moves while he played the violin were wild and crazy. Oh, yeah, let's blow the roof off this place. Come on, move it, thought Quinn as he continued to play. The more he got into playing, the more freely his magic flowed, making everyone who was listening to the melody, felt their hearts beat faster with excitement and exhilaration. Rum, pum, tum, and we are done, thought Quinn as he finished his piece and bowed to no one. Woohoo. I'm going to ace these exams. Bring it on. I'm going to smash the O.W.L.S. I'm going to get a girlfriend. Exams are nothing. I'm the smartest girl alive. Raxperts. I will recreate Rowena Ravenclaw's diadem. Where is Professor Flitwick? I challenge him to a duel. Quinn's piece had left the people in a hyped up state and filled with confidence and enthusiasm. It caused them to feel exhilarated and happy. Quinn smiled at the shouts coming from the common room and the dorms around him and knew that his showcase of mental and sound magic was a huge success. Looking at the violin and bow in his hands, Quinn nodded with a grin, yeah, I still got it. Scene break. A shady figure stood under the shade of a tree looking at the abandoned house with the windows and doors boarded up. The shrieking shack, muttered the figure looking at the building, which was supposed to be the most haunted in Britain. To think this shack would be hiding something of such importance. Rivers Lock smirked at the thought, it seems this building is just like me, and that's why it's going to get me what I want. The smirk from his face dropped like it was never there, and he thought about the circumstances that brought him here. A bunch of cowards, they are. How can they be scared when I'm planning their moves? Rivers Locke was the one who created and managed the group known as Novellus Oxyonites. Just within a couple years, he had been able to gather people together into his banner, and he did it without ever showing his face. But the series of raids from the Auror office had instilled fear in the members of Novellus Oxyonites, and when he tried to bring down the order, he didn't get much of a favorable response. I didn't ask them to go to those gatherings, Rivers clicked his tongue in distaste. If they wanted to mingle together like fools, they could have at least made sure they weren't tracked. The disadvantage of being a hidden leader was that he couldn't be involved too deeply without being in danger of revealing his identity. As such, he couldn't control what his followers did outside of the plans he drafted for them. He wanted people to be good with the disillusionment charm. People who would be able to get around without others noticing. But all he got was some dumb bozos who were absolutely shit at magic, who were complete rock brains and didn't have an ounce of cunning in them. But this opportunity was too critical for him to miss. The school was about to end soon, and if he didn't act, he would have to wait for the next few months to get the next chance. Rivers didn't have those months. The Aurors were striking hard on his minions, and he couldn't be sure what would be the situation down the line. 
And this opportunity was what he needed to gain the momentum back. If he could pull this off, then the world would know about Novellus Oxionites, and all the members who refused his calls like cowards would come scurrying back. I guess I will have to do this on my own. This is too important for me to leave it to the idiots, muttered Rivers. He decided that he would be going inside on his own with a couple more members that were at his disposal. The gears in his mind turned as he continued to stare at the abandoned and decrypt shack. Scene break. Quinn shimmied his way to the hospital wing with a rabbit in a cage. The rabbit had been very sick, infected with rabbit calicivirus, which was an illness that had an incubation period of 48 to 72 hours. Poppy had given him the brown rabbit and told him that he had a day and a half to return with a perfectly healthy rabbit. He knew nothing about calicivirus, it was a type of hemorrhagic disease virus. So he had only 48 to 72 hours to learn everyone about the disease and then heal the rabbit before it died. The research had been easy but lengthy, so by the time Quinn was done learning about the rabbit calicivirus, the rabbit was suffering from lethargy and fever. Quinn eradicated the disease from the brown rabbit and then healed the fluffy bunny. He did it within the confines of the time Poppy had given him, the rabbit was back to new in 24 hours. Poppy is slowly getting used to my learning speed. If I was still spending time at the vault, it probably would have taken me a day and a half. Quinn walked across the tiled floor of the hospital wing towards Poppy's office as he looked to the sides at the beds to see if she was tending to some students. And at the end of the wing hallway, Quinn stopped because he came across two people who he wasn't expecting to see in the hospital wing. Daphne. Astoria. Said Quinn, finding the green grass sisters with Astoria sitting on the bed while Daphne sat on a stool by her side. Multiple thoughts ran through his mind within the second he first laid eyes on the sister. What came out of his mouth was, have you seen Madame Pomfrey? I have something to talk with her. She is out for the moment. Went down to the dungeon to meet Professor Snape to get some potion ingredients, replied Daphne, and while Quinn couldn't get a read from her expression, her body language told him that she was feeling uncomfortable. You just missed her. She went out a minute ago, chimed in Astoria with a smile on her face. Quinn turned his eyes to the younger sister, and his stone-gray orbs noticed a pale pallor on her skin, a thin sheen of sweat on her face, her whites of eyes were muddled, and many other signs that Quinn had learned to pick up from his time with Poppy learning healing magic. She is obviously sick. The fact Poppy had to go out to obtain potion ingredients means this isn't a common ailment. I wonder what plagues her, thought Quinn before smiling and asking, may I join you too, ladies. Daphne opened her mouth to speak something, but Astoria beat it to her. Yes, please. You're free to join us, spoke Astoria with a smile on her face. Daphne glanced at her sister with an inscrutable expression that Astoria ignored, as she continued to smile towards Quinn. Quinn nodded and pulled a stool from beneath the bed. He took a seat and set the rabbit cage down on the floor. Astoria was sick, and Quinn didn't want to make it worse by introducing a rabbit to the girl. She does look the type who loves fluffy and cute things. How have you two been? asked Quinn, opening up the conversation. I hope you two are feeling fine, nothing serious, I hope. Quinn knew the topic would come with their location, so he decided to use it as an opener. Thank you for asking, we are doing fine, just a small dip in health, replied Daphne, matching eyes with Quinn. Ah, it is serious, then, thought Quinn and then he heard Daphne speak up. She must be worried. Even though she had used we in his answer, all three knew who she was talking to. You don't have to lie. We can't change anything about it, so why hide it, sighed Astoria and softly glanced at her older sister. She turned to Quinn and spoke without hesitation. I have Dash. Astoria. No, I'm telling him. There is nothing to hide, and I don't get why you get to decide. I'm the one who has it. I should be able to decide who to tell and who not to, answered Astoria in a firm tone, which was less weaker than her usual voice. Daphne softly sighed and closed her eyes in acceptance. She knew her little sister better than anyone and knew that when Astoria decided to do something, then even their parents wouldn't be able to change her mind. I have a condition known as blood male diction. A blood male diction is a curse of the darkest type, passed down to the descendants for generations. Even the most common type of blood male diction is known to stay in the family for half a century, said Astoria with a smile on her face as she was retelling a fascinating story. One of our ancestors was cursed with the curse, and from then on, the curse resurfaces even though it skips some generations. Our great-grandfather had it, and for two generations, our family was free of it, but it turned out that our generation wasn't so lucky because I got it. Quinn held his expression in place as he continued to listen to Astoria, and while the younger green grass spoke, Quinn felt the older sister glance at him from time to time. There are many types of blood male diction, the one I have causes debilitation, leaving me frail and sickly. From time to time, I suffer from these lapses in health that will leave me in a very fragile state. The usually young and bubbly of the Greengrass sisters smiled helplessly and sighed, unfortunately, the curse also reduces my lifespan. None of my ancestors who suffered from the curse ever lived past 50. Quinn silently listened to Astoria tell her story without uttering a word, and while he heard all of it, two things stood out to him. The blood male diction and the resignation in her voice hidden behind her smile. I see. So you have a blood male diction. Now, that is rare, isn't it? Started Quinn, and as he spoke, Quinn removed his Hogwarts robe from his shoulder. A curse that carries down to the descendants. Descendants that suffer from their ancestors' mistakes or misfortune. I guess if you can get your ancestors' fortunes, then getting their misfortune is a fair part of the deal. 
and while getting the curse is unfortunate, and I might seem presumptuous for saying it, I don't think I like the fact that you have accepted you'll never get rid of the curse. Quinn folded up the sleeves on both of his hands and secured them in place so they wouldn't slip. Astoria, don't get me wrong, I like the fact that you don't live your life in despair about your unfortunate circumstances, but your reason is wrong. You should happily live because you know that one day your curse will be erased and you will get to live just as everyone else does not because you are trying to live the most of your limited life. He smiled a wide grin as he spoke, where is the fun in that? If you accept that then there is no hope. That's no fun at all. Quinn put out both of his hands towards Astoria and gestured with his finger as he asked, give me your hands. Astoria and Daphne looked at Quinn with bewilderment. The light-hearted tone that Quinn spoke with made it seem that he was not taking this clearly heavy condition seriously. But the words did make some sense to them, and that left both the girls confused. Come on, now, don't be scared. I won't eat you. Give me your hands, asked Quinn once more. Astoria looked at Daphne for guidance, but the look in Daphne's eyes reflected the same confusion as her. So she hesitantly placed both her hands in Quinn's. Excellent, thank you for trusting me, smiled Quinn and gently grasped Astoria's petite hands. Now, let me show you some nifty magic. I think you two will like this. He pointed at his and Astoria's joined hands. The two green grass sisters looked down and witnessed the glowing red veins on Quinn's visible arms and hands. Astoria, I don't think you realize that we, who possess magic, are in the presence of something truly grand and extraordinary. The two girls watched with wide eyes as the glowing red veins seemed to creep from Quinn's hands to Astoria's hands through the connections of their hands. Magic has infinite potential, infinite? There is nothing that magic can't accomplish. Those who possess magic can be saints, gods, devils, or anything they want if they understand and know how to use what was so graciously given to them. The glowing red veins traveled up Astoria's arm, and as Quinn spoke, her entire body was covered in fiery red glowing veins. Astoria could feel a comfortable heat all around her body. I know this curse has been in your family for generations. And in all that time, there hasn't been a cure to this ailment that you don't deserve. But losing hope is losing the battle before even starting the fight. The glowing red veins on Quinn's forearms and Astoria's entire body turned into a sparkling blue color, showing a beautiful charm to the world. Astoria, who had been feeling a comfortable heat, now with the color change, felt a refreshing cool feeling envelope her body. She closed her eyes because it was the most pleasant she had ever felt. It felt like she was swimming in cool water, and she let go of everything and simply enjoying the bliss as she listlessly floated in the coolness. But then her eyes snapped open as she felt the frailness and sickness lessen and slowly disappear from her body. It wasn't just that, but the true shock was that her own delicate constitution felt strength and vitality that she had never felt before. She had never felt so, lively. Astoria felt like she could do anything right now. Astoria looked up from her hands and looked at Quinn, who was smiling with confidence. Astoria Greengrass, I, Quinn West, here and now, declares this to you. From this moment onwards, I assure you that as long as I am alive, you will never ever again feel the presence of the blood curse. Quinn's smile widened, and as did the eyes of Astoria. I will ensure that you will never suffer and feel weak because of the blood male diction. You will live a long life, and it will be a healthy life just like anyone else's. Astoria felt Quinn's grip slightly tighten as he announced. It's my promise to you, and I will never forget it. Dash asterisk asterisk dash asterisk asterisk dash asterisk. Quinn West, MC, promise of a lifetime. Astoria Greengrass, cursed, received a promise. Daphne Greengrass, worried elder sister, witnessed something magical. Rivers Locke, prideful, planning something big. Editor, Alan L., worried. Oh oh. This novel is possible because of a Patreon member request. You can become a Patreon member if you want to request. The link to my Patreon account is given at video discretion. It helps a lot thanks for watching this video. Also if you want to support the author of this novel, the link of the author's credit is given below.